Chapter 7 The sorcerer was young, thin, and sweating nervously, despite the cold of the musty cellar chamber that served as his living area and workroom. His second-hand robe was clammy with chill and soaked through with his own perspiration. He had every reason to be nervous. This was the first time he and his apprentice, who was now huddled out of the way in the corner, had ever attempted to bind an imp to his service. The summoning of a spirit from the abyssal plains is no small task, even if the spirit one hopes to summon is of the very least and lowliest of the demonic varietals. Demons and their ilk are always watching for a chance misstep, and some are more eager to take advantage of a mistake than others. The torches on the walls wavered and smoked, their odor of hot pitch nearly overwhelming the acrid tang of the incense he was burning. Mice squeaked and scuttled along the rafters overhead. Perhaps they were the cause of his distraction, for he was distracted for a crucial moment. And one of those that watched and waited seized the unhoped-for opportunity when the sorcerer thrice chanted not the name Talkarsh, the true name of the imp he meant to bind, but Thalkarsh. Incandescent ruby smoke rose and filled the interior of the diagram the mage had so carefully chalked upon the floor of his cluttered, dank, high-ceilinged stone chamber. It completely hid whatever was forming within the bespelled hexacle. But there was something there. He could see shadows moving within the veiling smoke. He waited, dry-mouthed in anticipation for the smoke to clear, so that he could intone his second incantation, one that would coerce the imp he'd summoned into the bottle that waited within the exact center of the hexacle. Then the smoke vanished as quickly as it had been conjured, and the young mage nearly fainted as he looked up at what stood there and looked higher. And his sallow bearded visage assumed the same lack of color as his chalk when the occupant, head just brushing the rafters, calmly stepped across the spellbound lines, bent slightly at the waist, and seized him none too gently by the throat. Thinking quickly, he summoned everything he knew in the way of arcane protections, spending magical energy with what in other circumstances might have been reckless wastefulness. There was a brief flare of light around him, and the demon dropped him, as a human would something that had unexpectedly scorched his hand. The mage cringed where he had fallen, squeezing his eyes shut. Oh, fool! The voice was like brazen gongs, just slightly out of tune with each other, and held no trace of pity. Look at me. The mage opened one eye, well aware of the duplicity of demons, yet unable to resist the command. His knowledge did him little good. His face went slack-jawed with bemusement at the serpentine beauty of the creature that stood over him. It had shrunk to the size of a very tall human, and its, his, eyes glowed from within, a rich ruby color reminiscent of wine catching sunlight. He was wonderful. He was the very image of everything the mage had ever dreamed of in a lover. The face was that of a fallen angel, the nude body that of a god, the ruby eyes promised and beckoned and were filled with an overwhelming and terribly masculine power. The magician's shields did not include those meant to ward off the glamouring. He threw every pitiful protection he directed to the four winds in an onslaught of delirious devotion. The demon laughed and took him into his arms. When he was finished amusing himself, He tore the whimpering creature that remained to shreds, slowly. It was only then, only after he'd destroyed the mage past any hope of resurrection, and when he was sated with the emanations of the mage's torment and death, that he paused to think, and, thinking, to regret his hasty action. There had been opportunity there, opportunity to be free forever of the abyssal plains, 
and more, a potential for an unlimited supply of those delights he'd just indulged in, if only he'd thought before he'd acted. But even as he was mentally cursing his own impulsiveness, his attention was caught by a hint of movement in the far corner. He grew to his full size and reached out lazily with one blood-smeared claw to pull the shivering, wretched creature that cowered there into the torchlight. It had soiled itself with fear. But by the torque around its throat and the cabalistic signs on its shabby robe, this pitiful thing must have been the departed mage's apprentice. Galkarsh chuckled, and the apprentice tried to shrink into insignificance. All was not yet lost. In fact, this terror-stricken youth was an even better candidate for what he had in mind than his master would have been. Thalkarsh bent his will upon the boy's mind. It was easy to read. The defenses his master had placed about him were few and weak, and fading with the master's death. Satisfied by what he read there, the demon assumed his most attractive aspect and spoke. Boy, would you live? More, would you prosper? The apprentice trembled and nodded slightly. His eyes glazed with horror, a fear that was rapidly being subsumed by the power the demon was exerting on his mind. See you this? The demon hefted the imp bottle that had been in the diagram with him. Plain reddish glass before, it now glowed from within, like the demon's eyes. Do you know what it is? The imp bottle, the boy whispered, after two attempts to get words out that failed. The one Leland meant to, to, to confine me in, or rather the imp he meant to call. It is a worthless bottle no more, thanks to having been within the magic confines of the diagram when I was summoned instead of the imp, it has become my focus. Did your master tell you what a demonic focus is? It, the boy stared in petrified fascination at the bottle in the demon's hand. It lets you keep yourself here of your own will, if you have enough power. The demon smiled. But I want more than freedom, boy. I want more than power. I have greater ambitions. And if you want to live, you'll help me achieve them. It was plain from the boy's eyes that he was more than willing to do just about anything to ensure his continued survival. How? What do you want? Thalkarsh laughed, and his eyes narrowed. Never mind, child. I have plans, and if you succeed in what I set out for you, you will have a life privileged beyond anything you can now imagine. You will become great, and I, I will become greater than your poor mind can dream. For now, child, this is how you can serve me. Here? Tarma asked her mage partner. You're sure? The sunset bathed her in a blood-red glow as they approached the trade gate of the city of Delton, and a warm spring breeze stirred a lock of coarse black hair that had escaped the confines of her short braids. Her hair had grown almost magically the past few months, as if it had resented being shorn. The last light dyed her brown leather tunic and breeches a red that was nearly black. Kethry's softly attractive face wore lines of strain, and there was worry in her emerald eyes. I'm sure it's here, and it's bad, whatever it is. This is the worst needs ever pulled on me that I can remember. It's worse than that business with Lady Miria, even. She pushed the hood of her traveling robe back from an aching forehead and rubbed her temples a little. Huh. Well... I hope that damn blade of yours hasn't managed to get us knee-deep into more than we can handle. Only one way to find out, though. The swordswoman kneed her horse into the lead, 
and the pair rode in through the gates after passing the cursory inspection of a somewhat nervous gate guard. He seemed oddly disinclined to climb down from his gatehouse post, being content to pass them through after a scant few moments' scrutiny. Tarma's ice-blue eyes scanned the area just inside the gate for signs of trouble, and found none. Her brow puckered in puzzlement. Shianadra, I find it hard to believe you're wrong, but this is the quietest town I've ever seen. I was expecting blood and rapine in the streets. I'm not mistaken, Kathry replied in a low, tense voice. And there's something very wrong here. The very quiet is wrong. It's too quiet. There's no one at all on the streets. No beggars, no whores, no nothing. Tarma looked about her with increased alertness. Now that Kath had mentioned it, this looked like an empty town. There were no loiterers to be seen in the vicinity of the trade gate or the inns that clustered about the square just inside it, and that was very odd indeed. No beggars, no thieves, no whores, no strollers, no street musicians, just the few stable hands and inn servants that had to be outside, leading in the beasts of fellow travelers, lighting lanterns and torches and those few betook themselves back inside as quickly as was possible. The square of the trade-ins was ominously deserted. Warrior's oath, this is blamed spooky. I don't like the look of this. Not one bit. Neither do I. Pick us an inch, Yenidra. Pick one fast. If the locals don't want to be out of doors after sunset, they must have a reason, and I'd rather not be out here either. Tarma chosen in with the sign of a black sheep hanging above the door, and the words, for the benefit of those that could read, the black U, painted on the wall beside the door. It looked to be about the right sort for the state of their purses, which were getting a bit on the lean side. They'd been riding the trade road north to Valdemar, once again looking for work, when Kethry's gesh-forged blade need had drawn them eastward, until they ended up here. The sword had left them pretty much alone, except for a twinge or two, and the incident with the feckless priestess that had wound up being far more complicated than it had needed to be, thanks to the imp of the perverse and Tarma's own big mouth. Tarma was beginning to hope that it had settled down. And then, this afternoon, Kethry had nearly fainted when it called with all of its old urgency. They'd obeyed its summons, until it led them at last to Delton. Tarma saw to the stabling of their beasts, Kethry to bargaining for a room. The innkeeper looked askance at a mage wearing a sword, for those who trafficked in magic seldom carried physical weaponry, but he was openly alarmed by the sight of what trotted at Tarma's heels, a huge, black, wolf-like creature whose shoulders came nearly as high as the swordswoman's waist. Kethry saw the alarm in his eyes, realized that he had never seen a Kyrie before, and decided to use his fear as a factor in her bargaining. My familiar, she said nonchalantly, and he knows when I'm being cheated. The price of their room took a mysterious plunge. After installing their gear and settling Worrell in their room, they returned to the tap room for supper and information. If the streets were deserted, the taproom was crowded far past its intended capacity. Tarma wrinkled her nose at the effluvia of cheap perfume, unwashed bodies, stale food odors, and fish oil lanterns. Kethry appeared not to notice. Tarma's harsh, hawk-like features could be made into a veritable mask of intimidation when she chose to scowl. She did so now. Her ice-cold stare got them two stools and a tiny round table to themselves. Her harsh voice summoned a harried servant as easily as Kethry could summon a creature of magic. A hand to her knife hilt and the ostentatious shrugging of the sword slung on her back into a more comfortable position got her speedy service. Cleaning her fingernails with her knife got them decent portions and scrubbed plates. Kethry's frown of worry softened a bit. Life has been ever so much easier since I teamed with you, Shianadra, she chuckled quietly, 
moving the sides of her robe out of the way so that she could sit comfortably. No doubt, the swordswoman replied with a lifted eyebrow and a quirk to one corner of her mouth. Sometimes I wonder how you managed without me. Poorly, the green eyes winked with mischief. Their food arrived and they ate in silence, furtively scanning the crowded room for a likely source of information. When they'd nearly finished, Kathry nodded slightly in the direction of a grizzled mercenary sitting just underneath one of the smoking lanterns. Tarma looked him over carefully. He looked almost drunk enough to talk, but not drunk enough to make trouble, and his companions had just deserted him, leaving seats open on the bench opposite his. He wore a badge, so he was mastered and so was less likely to pick a fight. They picked up their tankards and moved to take those vacant seats beside him. He nodded as they sat, warily at Tarma, appreciatively at Kethry. He wasn't much for idle chatter, though. Evening, was all he said. It is that, Tarma replied. Though tis a strange enough evening and more than a bit early for folk to be closing themselves indoors, especially with the weather so pleasant. These are strange times, he countered, and strange things happen in the nights around here. Oh? Kathry looked flatteringly interested. What sort of strange things? And can we take care of your thirst? He warmed to the admiration and the offer. Folk being gone missing. Horse, street trash, such as won't be looked for by the watch, he told them, wiping his mouth on his sleeve while Tarma signaled the serving wench. He took an enormous bite of the spiced sausage that was the black ewe's specialty. Grease ran into his beard. He washed the bite down by draining his tankard dry. There's rumors. His eyes took on a certain wariness. He cast an uneasy glance around the dim, hot, and odorous taproom. Rumors, Tarma prompted, pouring his tankard full again and sliding a silver piece under it. Well, we little care for rumors, eh? What's rumor to a fighter but ale talk? Plague take rumors, he agreed, but his face was strained. What have magicas and demons got to do with us, so long as they leave our masters in peace? He drained the vessel and pocketed the coin. So long as he leaves a few for me, this Thalkarsh can have his filler horse. Thalkarsh? What might that be? Some great lecher that he has need of so many light skirts? Tarma filled the tankard for the third time and kept her tone carefully casual. Shh! The mercenary paled and made a cautionary wave with his hand. Tisn't wise to bandy that name about lightly. Them as doors often aren't to be seen again. That one I mentioned, well, some say he's a god. Some, a demon summoned by a mighty powerful magicker. All I know is that he has a temple on the row one that sprang up overnight seemingly, and one with statues and such that could make me blush were I to go view him. The which I won't. Tisn't safe to go near there. So, Tarma raised one eyebrow. They sent the city guard trooping in there after the first trollops went missing. There were tales spread of blood worship, so the city council reckoned somebody'd better check. Nobody ever saw so much as a scrap of boot leather of that guard squad ever again. So, folk huddle behind their doors at night and hope that they'll be left in peace, hmm? Kathry mused aloud, taking her turn at replenishing his drink. But are they? Rumor says not. Not unless they care to stay in company at night. Odd thing, though, except for the city guard. Most of the ones taken by night have been women. I'd watch myself were I you twain. He drained his tankard yet again. This proved to be one tankard too many, as he slowly slid off the bench to lie beneath the table, a bemused smile on his face. They took the godsent opportunity to escape to their room. Well, Tarma said, once the door had been bolted, we know why. 
And now we know what. Bloody hell. I wish for once that that damned sword of yours would steer us towards something that pays. Kathry worked a minor magic that sent the vermin sharing their accommodations skittering under the door and out the open window. Worrell surveyed her handiwork, sniffed the room over carefully, then lay down at the foot of the double pallet with a heavy sigh. That's not quite true. We don't really know what we're dealing with. Is it a god, truly? If it is, I don't stand much chance of making a dent in its hide. Is it a demon, controlled by this magician, that has been set up as a god so that its master can acquire power by blood magic? Or is it worse than either? What could possibly be worse? A demon loose, uncontrolled. A demon with ambition, Kethry said, flopping down beside Worrell and staring up at nothing, deep in thought. Their lantern, more fish oil, smoked and danced and made strange shadows on the wall and ceiling. Worst case would be just that, a demon that knows exactly how to achieve godhood and one with nothing standing in the way of his intended path. If it is a god, a real god, well, all gods have their enemies. It's simply a matter of finding the sworn enemy, locating a nest of his clerics and bringing them all together. And a demon under the control of a mage can be sent back to the abyssal plains by discovering the summoning spell and breaking it. But an uncontrolled demon, the only way to get rid of it that I know of is to find its focus object and break it. Even that may not work if it has achieved enough power. With enough accumulated power, or enough worshippers believing in his godhood, even breaking his focus wouldn't send him back to the abyssal plains. If that happens, well, you first have to find a demon-killing weapon, then you have to get close enough to strike a killing blow, and you hope that he isn't strong enough to have gone beyond needing a physical form, or you damage him enough to break the power he gets from his follower's belief, but that's even harder to do than finding a demon-killing blade. And, needless to say, demon-killing weapons are few and far between. And it isn't terribly likely that you're going to get past a demon's reach to get that killing blow in once he's taken his normal form. Tarma pulled off her boots and inspected the soles with a melancholy air. How likely is that? An uncontrolled demon? Not really likely, Kathry admitted. I'm just being careful, giving you worst case first. It's a lot more likely that he's under the control of a mage that's using him to build a power base for himself. That's the scenario I'd bet on. I've seen this trick pulled more than once before I met you. It works quite well, provided you can keep giving your congregation what they want. So, what's next? Well, I'd suggest we wait until morning and see what I can find out among the mages while you see if you can get any more mercenaries to talk. Somehow I was afraid you'd say that. They met back at the inn at noon. Tarma was empty-handed, but Kethry had met with a certain amount of success. At least she had a name, an address, and a price, a fat skin of strong wine taken with her, with a promise of more to come. The address was in the scummiest section of the town, hard by the communal refuse heap. Both women kept their hands on the hilts of their blades while making their way down the rank and odorous alleyway. There were flickers of movement at various holes in the walls, you could hardly call them doors or windows, but they were left unmolested. More than one of the piles of what seemed to be rotting refuse that dotted the alley proved to be a human, though it was difficult to tell for certain if they were living humans or corpses. Kethry again seemed blithely unaware of the stench. Tarma fought her stomach and tried to breathe as little as possible, and that little through her mouth. At length, they came to a wall that boasted a proper door. Kethry rapped on it. A mumbled voice answered her. She whispered something Tarma couldn't make out. Evidently, it was the proper response, as the door swung open long enough for them to squeeze through. 
then shut hurriedly behind them. Tarma blinked in surprise at what lay beyond the alley side door. The fetid aroma of the air outside was gone. There was a faint ghost of wine and an even fainter ghost of incense. The walls were covered with soft, colorful rugs. More rugs covered the floor. On top of the rugs were huge, plush cushions. The room was a rainbow of subtle reds and oranges and yellows. Tarma was struck with a sudden closing of the throat, and she blinked to clear misting eyes. This place reminded her forcibly of a Shinain tent. Fortunately, the woman who turned from locking the door to greet them was not a clanswoman, or Tarma might have had difficulty in ridding her eyes of that traitorous mist. She was draped head to toe with a veritable marketplace full of veils, so that only her eyes showed. The voluminous covering, which rivaled the room for color and variety of pattern, was not, however, enough to hide the fact that she was wraith-thin, and above the veils, the black eyes were gray-ringed, bloodshot, and haggard. You know my price, came a thin whisper. Kathry let the heavy wineskin slide to her feet, and she nudged it over to the woman with one toe. Three more to follow, one every two days from the master of the Black U. What do you wish to know? How comes this thing they call Salkash here, and why? The woman laughed crazily. Tarma loosened one of her knives in its hidden arm sheath. What in the name of the warrior had Kathry gotten them into? For that, I need not even scry. Oh no, to my sorrow, that is something I know only too well. The eyes leaked tears. Tarma averted her gaze, embarrassed. A curse on my own pride, and another on my curiosity, for now he knows my aura, knows it well, and calls me, and only the wine can stop my feet from taking me to him. The thin voice whined to a halt, and the eyes closed, as if in a sudden spasm of pain. For a long moment, the woman stood, still as a thing made of wood, and Tarma feared they'd get nothing more out of her. Then the eyes opened again, and fixed Kethry with a stiletto-like glare. Hear then the tale of my folly. Tis short enough. When Thalkash raised his temple, all in a single night, I thought to scry it and determine what sort of creature was master of it. My soul self was trapped by him, like a cruel child traps a mouse, and, like cruel children, he and his priest tormented it. For how long I cannot say. Then they seem to forget me, let me go again, to crawl back to myself. But they had not forgotten me. I soon learned that each night he would call me back to his side. Each night I drink until I can no longer hear the call, but each night it takes more wine to close my ears. One night it will not be enough, and I shall join his other brides. The veils shook and trembled. This much only did I learn. Thalkash is a demon, summoned by mistake instead of an imp. He bides here by virtue of his focus, the bottle that was meant to contain the imp. He is powerful. His priest is a mage as well, and has his own abilities augmented by the demons. No sane person would bide in this town with them rising to prominence here. The woman turned back to the door in a flutter of thin fabric and cracked it open again. One stick-like arm and hand pointed the way out. That is my reed. Take it, if you are not fools. Tarma was only too pleased to escape the chamber, which seemed rather too confining of a sudden. Kethry paused, concern on her face, to reach a tentative hand toward the veiled mystery. The woman made a repudiating motion. Do not pity me, she whispered harshly. You cannot know. He is terrible, but he is also glorious, so glorious. Her eyes glazed for a moment, then focused again, and she slammed the door shut behind them. Kethry laced herself into the only dress she owned, 
a sensuous thing of forest green silk, a scowl twisting her forehead. Why do I have to be the one poured at and drooled over? Tarma chuckled. You were the one who decreed against using any more magic than we had to, she pointed out. Well, I don't want to chance that mage detecting it and getting curious. And you were the one who didn't want to chance using illusion. What if something should break it? Then don't complain if I can't take your place. You happen to be the one of us that is lovely, amber-haired, and toothsome, not I. And you are the one with the manor born. No merchant lord or minor noble is going to open his doors to a nomad mercenary, and no decadent stripling is going to whisper secrets into the ear of one with a face like an ill-tempered hawk and a body like a sword blade. Now hurry up or the market will be closed and we'll have to wait until tomorrow. Kathry grumbled under her breath, but put more speed into her preparations. They sallied forth into the late afternoon, playing parts they had often taken before. Kethry assuming the manners of the rank she actually was entitled to, playing the minor noblewoman on a journey to relatives with Tarma as her bodyguard. As was very often the case, the marketplace was also the gathering place for the offspring of what passed for aristocracy in this borderland trade town. Within no great span of time, Kethry had garnered invitations to dine with half a dozen would-be gallants. She chose the most dissipated of them, but persuaded him to make a party of the occasion and invite his friends. A bit miffed by the spoiling of his plans, which had not included having any competition for Kethry's assets, he agreed. As with the common folk, the well-born had taken to closing themselves behind sturdy doors at the setting of the sun, and with it already low in the west, he hastened to send a servant around to collect his chosen companions. The young man's father was not at home, being off on a trading expedition. This had figured very largely in his plans, for he had purloined the key to his father's plushly appointed gazebo for his entertainment. The place was as well furnished as many homes, full of soft divans and wide couches, and boasting seven little alcoves off the main room and two further rooms for intimate entertainment besides. Tarma's acting abilities were strained to the uttermost by the evening's events. She was hard put to keep from laughing aloud at Kethry's performance and the reactions of the young men to her. To anyone who did not know her, Kethry embodied the very epitome of light-minded, light-skirted, capricious demi-nobility. No one watching her would have guessed she ever had a thought in her head besides her own pleasuring. To the extreme displeasure of those few female companions that had been brought to the festivities, she monopolized all the male attention in the room. It wasn't long before she had sorted out which of them had actually been to one of the infamous rites of dark desires and which had only heard rumors. Those who had not been bold enough to attend discovered themselves subtly dismissed from the inner circle and soon repaired to the gardens or semi-private alcoves to enjoy the attentions of the females they had brought but ignored. Kethry lured the three favored swains into one of the private rooms, motioning Tarma to remain on guard at the door. She eventually emerged, hot-eyed, contemptuous, and disheveled. Snores echoed from the room behind her. Let's get out of here before I lose my temper and go back to wring their necks, she snarled, while Tarma choked back a chuckle. Puppies, they should still be in diapers, every one of them, not anything resembling a real adult among them, I swear to you. Ah, never mind. I'd just like to see them get some of the treatment they've earned, like a good spanking and a long stint in a hermitage, preferably one in the middle of a desert stocked with nothing but hard-bred water and boring religious texts. No one followed them out into the night, which was not overly surprising, given the fears of the populace. I hope it was worth it, Tarma said, as casually as she could. It was, Kethry replied, a little cooler.
They were all very impressed with the whole ritual and remembered everything they saw in quite lurid detail. It seems that it is the high priest who is the one truly in command. From the sound of it, my guess was right about his plans. He conducts every aspect of the ritual. He calls the god up and he sends him back again. The god selects those of the females brought to him that he wants. The male followers get what's left or share the few female followers he has. It's a rather unpleasant combination of human sacrifice and orgy. The high priest must be the magician that summoned the demon in the first place. He's almost certainly having the demon transform himself, since the god is almost unbearably attractive, and the females he selects go to him willingly, at least at first. After his initial attentions, they are no longer in any condition to object to much of anything. Those three back there were positively obscene. They gloated over all the details of what Thalkash does to his brides, all the while doing their best to get me out of my clothing so they could demonstrate the rites. It was all I could do to keep from throwing up on them. You sleep-spelled them? Better. I dream-spelled them, just like I did with our customers when I was posing as a whore back when we first met. It's as easy as sleep-spelling them. It's a very localized magic that isn't likely to be detected, and it will keep our disguises intact. They'll have the best time their imaginations can possibly provide. Kethry looked suddenly weary as they approached their inn. Bespeak me a bath, would you, dear heart? I feel filthy, inside and out. The next night was the night of Moondark the night of one of the more important of the new deity's rituals, and there was a pair of spies watching the streets that led to Temple Row with particular care. Those two pairs of eyes paid particularly close attention to two women making their cautious way through the darkened and deserted streets, muffled head to toe in cloaks. Though faint squeals and curses showed that neither of them could see well enough to avoid the rocks and fetid heaps of refuse that dotted the street, they seemed not to wish any kind of light to brighten their path. Gold peeked out from the hoods. The half-seen faces were old before their time. Their eyelids drooped with boredom that had become habit, but their eyes revealed a kind of fearful anticipation— their destination was the Temple of Thalkarsh. They were intercepted, a block away, by two swiftly moving figures who neatly knocked them unconscious and spirited them into a nearby alleyway. Tarma spat out several unintelligible oaths. The dim light of a heavily shuttered dark lantern fell on the two bodies at her feet. Beneath the cloaks, the now unconscious women had worn little more than heavy jewelry and a strategically placed veil or two. We'll be searched, you can bet on it, she said in disgust. And where the bloody hell are we going to hide weapons in these outfits? In truth, there wasn't enough cover among the chains and medallions to have concealed even the smallest of her daggers. We can't, Catherine replied flatly. So, that leaves Swarrel? Tarma pursed her lips. Hmm, that's a thought. Furface, could you carry two swords? The Kairi cocked his head to one side and experimentally mouthed Need's sheath. Kethry took the blade off and held it for him to take. He swung his head from side to side a little, then dropped the blade. Not that way, Tarma heard in her mind. Too clumsy. Won't balance right. Couldn't run or jump, might get stuck in a tight doorway. I want to be able to bite. These teeth aren't just for decoration, you know. And anyway, I can't carry two blades at the same time in my mouth. Could we strap them to you somehow? If you do, I can try how it feels. Using their belts, they managed to strap the blades along his flanks, one on either side to Worrell's satisfaction. He ran from one end of the alley to the other, then shook himself carefully without dislodging them or getting tangled by them. It'll work, he said with satisfaction. Let's go. They left their victims sleeping in a dead-end alley. 
they'd be rather embarrassed when they woke stark naked in the morning. They'd come to no harm. Thanks to Thalkarsh, not even criminals moved about the city by night, and the evening was warm enough that they wouldn't suffer from exposure. Whether or not they'd die of mortification remained to be seen. The partners left their own clothing hidden in another alley farther on. Muffled in the stolen cloaks, they approached the temple. Worrell, a shadow flitting behind them. On seeing the entrance, Tarma gave a snort of disgust. It was gaudy and decadent in the extreme, with carvings and statuary depicting every vice imaginable, and some she'd never dreamed existed, encrusting the entire front face. The single guard was a fat, homely man who moved slowly and clumsily, as if he were under the influence of a drug. He seemed little interested in the men who passed him by, other than seeing that they dropped their cloaks and giving them a cursory search for weaponry. The women were another case altogether. Between the preoccupation he was likely to have once he'd seen Kethry and the shadows cast by the carvings and the torchlight, Worrell should have no difficulty in slipping past him. Kethry touched the swordswoman's arm slightly as they stood in line and nodded toward the guard, giving a little wiggle as she did so. Tarma knew what that meant. Kethry was going to make certain the guard's attention stayed on her. The Shinain dropped her eyelids briefly in assent. When their turn came and they dropped their cloaks, Kethry posed and postured provocatively beneath the guard's searching hands. He was so busy filling his eyes and greasy paws with her that he paid scant attention to either Tarma or the shadow that slipped inside behind her. When he delayed long enough that there was considerable grumbling from those waiting their turn behind the two women, he finally let Kethry pass with real reluctance. They slipped inside the smoke-wreathed portal and found themselves walking down a dark corridor, heavy with the scent of cloying incense. When the corridor ended, they passed through a curtain of some heavy material that moved of itself, as if it sensed their presence and had a slippery feel and a sour smell to it. Once past that last obstruction, they found themselves blinking in the light of the temple proper. The interior was almost austere compared with the exterior. The walls were totally bare of ornamentation. The pillars upholding the roof were simple columns and not debauched caryatids. That simplicity left the eye only one place to go the altar, a massive black slab with manacles at each corner and what could only be blood grooves carved into its surface. There was no sign of any bottle. There were huge lanterns suspended from the ceiling and torches in brackets on the pillars, but the walls themselves were in shadow. There were braziers sending plumes of incense into the air on either side of the door. Beneath the too sweet odor, Tarma recognized the taint of tran dust. This was where and how the guard had acquired his dreamy clumsiness. She nudged Kethry, and they moved hastily along the wall to a spot where a draft carried fresher air to them. Tran dust was dangerous at best, and could be fatal to them, for it slowed reactions and blurred the senses. They would need both at full sharpness tonight. There was a drumming, and an odd, wild music that was almost more felt than heard. From a doorway behind the altar emerged the high priest. At this distance, little more than a vague shape in elaborate robes of crimson and gold. Behind him came an acolyte, carrying an object that made Kathry's eyes widen with satisfaction. It was a bottle, red that glowed dimly from within. The acolyte fitted this into a niche in the foot of the altar near the edge, the place all the blood grooves drained into. They worked their way closer, moving carefully along the wall. When they were close enough to make out the high priest's features, Kathry became aware of his intensely sexual attraction. As if to underscore this, She saw eager devotion written plainly on the face of a woman standing near to the altar place. 
She tightened her lips. Evidently, this was one aspect of domination that both high priest and demon deity shared. She warded her own mind against beglamorment. Tarma she knew she need not protect. By her very nature as sword sworn, she would be immune to this kind of deception. A gong began sounding, slowly, insistently. The music increased in tempo, built to a crescendo, a blood-red brightness behind the altar intensified, echoing the rising music. At the climax of both, when the altar was almost too bright to look at, something appeared, pulling all the light and sound into itself. He was truly beautiful, poisonously beautiful. Compared to him, the priest's attraction was insignificant. The line of women being brought in by two more acolytes seized their fearful trembling, sighed, and yearned toward him. He beckoned to one, who literally ran to him eagerly. Tarma turned her eyes resolutely away from the spectacle being presented at the altar place. There was nothing either of them could do to help the intended sacrifice. She was thanking her goddess that need was not at Kethry's hand just now. The sorceress had been known once or twice to become a berserker under the blade's influence, and she was not altogether sure how much the sword was capable of in the way of thought. It wasn't mindless, but in a situation like this, it was moot whether or not it would prefer the long-term goal of destroying the demon as opposed to the short-term goal of ending the sacrifice's torment. At least the rest of the devotees were so preoccupied with the victim and her suffering that they scarcely noticed the two women slowly making their way closer to the altar. Tarma looked closely into one face and quickly looked away nauseated. Those glazed eyes, swollen lips, the panting. It would have been obvious even to a child that the man was erotically enraptured by what he was watching. Tarma caught Kathri's eyes a moment. The other nodded, lips tightly compressed. The Shinaeen swordswoman was past hoping to end this quietly. She had begun to devoutly wish for a chance to cleave a few skulls around here, and she had a shrewd suspicion that Kethry felt the same. The young high priest looked up from his work and saw the anomalous. Two women, dressed as devotees, but paying no attention to the rites, and seemingly immune to the magical charisma of Thalkarsh. They had worked their way nearly to the altar itself. He looked sharply at them, and noted the fighter's muscles and the faint aura of the god touched about the thin one, then the unmistakable presence of a warding spell on the other. His mind flared with sudden alarm. He stepped forward once, he was given no time to act on his suspicions. Tarma saw his alerted glance and whistled shrilly for Worrell. From the crowd to the left of her came shouts, then screeches, and the sound of panic. Worrell was covering the distance between himself and Tarma with huge leaps and was slashing out with his teeth as he did so. The worshippers scrambled to get out of the way of those awful jaws, clearing the last few feet for him. He skidded to a halt beside her. With one hand, she snatched Need from her sheath and tossed her to Kethry. With the other, she unsheathed her own blade, turning the operation into an expert stroke that took out the two men nearest her. Worrell took his stand, guarding Tarma's back. Need had sailed sweetly into Kethry's hand, hilt first. She turned her catch into a slash that mirrored Tarma's and cleared space for herself. Then she found herself forced to defend against two sorts of attack— the physical, by the temple guards, and the magical, by the high priest. While the demon unaccountably watched but did nothing, the priest forced Kethry back against the wall. As bolts of force crashed against the shield she'd hastily thrown up, Kethry had first-hand proof that his magics had been augmented by the demon. Even so, she was the more powerful magician, but she was being forced to divide her attentions. Worrell solved the problem. The priest mage was not expecting a physical attack. Worrell's charge from the side brought him down, and in moments the Kyrie had torn out his throat. That left Kethry free to erect a magical barrier between themselves and reinforcements for the guards they were cutting down. 
she breathed a prayer of thanks to whatever power might be listening as she did so. Thanks that the past few months had required so little of her talents that her arcane armaments and energy reserves were at their height. Tarma grinned maliciously as a wall of fire sprang up at Kethri's command, cutting them off from the rest of the temple. Now there were only two acolytes, the remaining handful of guards, and the oddly inactive demon to face. Hold. The voice was quiet, yet stirred uneasiness in Tarma's stomach. She tried to move, and found that she couldn't. The guards were utterly motionless, as lifeless as statues. Only the acolytes were able to move, and all their attention was on the demon. His gaze was bent on Kethry. Tarma heard a rumbling snarl from behind the altar. Before she could try to prevent him, Wara leaped from the body of the high priest in a suicidal attack on the demon. Thalkarsh did not even glance in the Kyrie's direction. He intercepted Worrell's attack with a seemingly negligent backhanded slap. The Kyrie yelped as the hand caught him and sent him crashing into the wall behind Tarma, limp and silent. Woman, I could use you. The demon's voice was low and persuasive. Your knowledge is great, the power you command formidable, and you have infinitely more sense than that poor fool your familiar killed. I could make you a queen among magicians. I would make you my consort. Tarma fumed in impotence as the demon reached for her oathkin. Kethry's mind bent under the weight of the demon's attentions. It was incredibly difficult to think clearly. All her thoughts seemed washed out in the red glare of his gaze. Her enchantments to counter beguilement seemed as thin as silk veils and about as protective. You think me cruel, evil. Yet whatever have I done save to give each of these people what he wants? The women have but to see me to desire me. The men lust for what women I do not care to take. All my worshippers want power. All these things I have given in exchange for worship. Surely that is fair, is it not? It would be cruelty to withhold these things, not cruelty to bestow them. His voice was reasoned and persuasive. Kethry found herself wavering from what she had until now thought to be the truth. Is it the bonds with that scrap of steel that trouble you? Fear not. It would be the work of a single thought to break them. And think of the knowledge that would be yours in the place at my side. Think of the power. His eyes glowed yet more brightly and seductively and they filled her vision. Think of the pleasure. Pain lancing across her thoughts woke her from the dreams called up by those eyes. She looked down at the blood trickling along her right hand. She'd clenched it around the bare blade of her sword with enough force to cut her palm, and with the pain came the return of independent thought. Even if everything he said were true, and not the usual truth-twisting demons found so easy, she was not free to follow her own will. There were other, older promises that bound her. There was the gesh she had willingly taken with the fighting gifts bestowed by need, and the pledge she had made as a white wind sorceress to use her powers for the greater good of mankind, and by no means least, there was the vow she had made before all of Liha Irden, pledging Tarma that one day she would take a mate or mates and raise a clutch of children to bear the banner and name of Tarma's lost clan. Only death itself could keep her from fulfilling that vow, and it would kill Tarma should she violate it. She stared back at the demon's inhuman eyes, defiance written in every fiber. He flared with anger. You are the more foolish then, he growled and backhanded her into the wall as casually as he had Worrell. She was halfway expecting such a move, and managed to relax enough to take the blow limply. It felt rather like being hit with a battering ram, 
but the semi-consciousness she displayed as she slid into a heap was mostly feigned. You will find you have ample leisure to regret your defiance later, he snarled, in the same petulant tones as a thwarted, spoiled child. Now he turned his attentions to Tarma. So, the nomad. Tarma did her best to simulate a fascination with the demon that she did not in the least feel. It seems that I must needs petition the swordswoman. Well enough, it may be that you are even more suitable than your foolish companion. The heat of his gaze was easily dissipated by the cool armoring of her goddess that sheathed Tarma's heart and soul. There simply was nothing there for the demon to work on. The sensual, emotional parts of her nature had been subsumed into devotion to the warrior when Tarma had sworn sword oath. But he couldn't know that. Or could he? At any rate, her attempt to counterfeit the same bemused rapture his brides had shown was apparently successful. You are no beauty. Well then, look into my eyes and see the face and body that might be yours as my priestess. Tarma looked. She dared not look away. His eyes turned mirror-like. She saw herself reflected in them. Then she saw herself change. The lovely, lithe creature that gazed back at her was still recognizably Tarma, but oh, the differences that a few simple changes made. This was a beauty that was a match for Thalkarsh's own. For a scant second, Tarma allowed herself to be truly caught by that vision. The demon felt her waver and in that moment of weakness exerted his power on the bond that made her Kalenadral. And Tarma realized at that instant that Thalkarsh was truly on the verge of attaining godlike powers, for she felt the bond weaken. Thalkarsh frowned at the unexpected resistance he encountered, then turned his full attention to breaking the stubborn strength of the bond, and that changing of the focus of his attention in turn released Tarma from her entrapment. Not much, but enough for her to act. Tarma had resisted the demon with every ounce of stubbornness in her soul, augmenting the strength of the bond, but she wasn't blind to what was going on around her, and to her horror, she saw Kethry creeping up on the demon's back, a fierce and stubborn anger in her eyes. Tarma knew that no blow the sorceress struck would do more than anger Thalkarsh. She decided to yield the tiniest bit, timing her moment of weakness with care, waiting until the instant need was poised to strike at the demon's unprotected back. And as Thalkarsh's magical grip loosened, her own blade hand snapped out, hilt foremost, to strike and break the demon's focus bottle. At the exact moment Tarma moved, Kethry buried knee to the hilt in the demon's back. As the sound of breaking glass echoed and re-echoed the length and breadth of the temple, any one of those actions by itself might not have been sufficient to defeat him. But combined, Thalkarsh screamed in pain, unanticipated, unexpected, and all the worse for that. He felt at the same moment a good half of his stored power flowing out of him like water from a broken bottle. A broken bottle! His focus was gone! And pain, like a red-hot iron, seared through him, shaking him to the roots of his being. He lost his carefully cultivated control. His focus was destroyed, and with it, the power he had been using to hold his followers in thrall. And the pain... It could not destroy him, but he was not used to being the recipient of pain. It took him by surprise and broke his concentration and cost him yet more power. He lost mastery of his form. He took on his true demonic aspect, as horrifying as he had been beautiful. And now his followers saw for the first time the true appearance of what they had been calling a god. Their faith had been shaken when he did nothing to save the life of his high priest. Now it was destroyed by the panic they felt on seeing what he was. They screamed, 
turned mindlessly, and attempted to flee. His storehouse of power was gone. His other power source was fleeing madly in fear. His focus was destroyed, and he was racked with pain, he who had never felt so much as a tiny pinprick before. Every spell he had woven fell to ruins about him. Thalkarsh gave a howling screech that rose until the sound was nearly unbearable. He again slapped Kathri into the wall. Somehow, she managed to take her blade with her, but this time, her limp unconsciousness as she slid down the wall was not feigned. He howled again, burst into a tower of red and green flame, and the walls began to shift. Tarma dodged past him and dragged Kethry under the heavy marble slab of the altar, then made a second trip to drag Worrell under its dubious shelter. The ground shook, and the remaining devotees rushed in panic-stricken confusion from one hoped-for exit to another. The ceiling groaned with a living voice, and the air was beginning to cloud with a sulfurous fog. Then cracks appeared in the roof, and the trapped worshippers screeched hopelessly as it began to crumble and fall in on them. Tarma crouched beneath the altar stone, protecting the bodies of Kethri and Worrell with her own, and hoped the altar was strong enough to shelter them as the temple began falling to ruins around them. It seemed like an eternity, but it couldn't have been more than an hour or two before dawn that they crawled out from under the battered slab, pushing and digging rubble out of the way with hands that were soon cut and bleeding. Worrell did his best to help, but his claws and paws were meant for climbing and clinging, not digging, and besides that, he was suffering from more than one cracked rib. Eventually, Tarma made him stop trying to help before he lamed himself. Fah! she said distastefully when they emerged. The stone, or whatever it was, that the building had been made of was rotting away, and the odor was overpowering. She heaved herself wearily up onto the cleaner marble of the altar and surveyed the wreckage about them. Gods! To think I wanted to do this quietly! Well, is it gone, I wonder, or did we just chase it away for a while? Kethry crawled up beside her, wincing. I can't tell. There's too many factors involved. I don't think Need is a demon killer, but I don't know everything there is to know about her. Did we get rid of him because he lost the faith of his devotees? Because you broke the focus? Because of the wound I gave him? Or all three? And does it matter? He won't be able to return unless he's called, and I can't imagine anyone wanting to call him. Not for a long, long time. She paused, then continued. You had me frightened, Shianadra. Why for? I didn't know what he was offering you in return for your services. I was afraid if he could see your heart. He didn't offer me anything I really wanted, dearling. I was never in any danger. All he wanted to give me was a face and figure to match his own. But if he'd offered you your clan and your voice back, Kathry replied soberly. I still wouldn't have been in any danger, Tarma replied with a little more force than she intended. My people are dead, and no demon could bring them back to life. They've gone on elsewhere, and he could never touch them. And without them, she made a tiny, tired shrug. Without them. What use is my voice? Or, for that matter, the most glorious face and body and all the power in the universe? I thought he had you for a moment. So did he. He was trying to break my bond with the star-eyed. What he didn't know was all he was arousing was my disgust. I'd die before I'd given to something that uses people as casually as that thing did. Kethry got her belt and sheath off Worrell and slung Need in her accustomed place on her hip. Tarma suppressed the urge to giggle, despite pain and weariness. Kethry, in the sorceress's robes she usually wore and belted with a blade, looked odd enough. Kethry, dressed in three spangles and a scrap of cloth and wearing the sword, looked totally absurd. 
Nevertheless, Tarma copied her example. Well, that damn goat sticker of yours got us into another one we won't get paid for, she said in more normal tones, fastening the buckle so that her sword hung properly on her back. Bloody hell, if you count in the ale we had to pour and the bribes we had to pay, we lost money on this one. Don't be so certain of that, Shianadra. Kethry's face was exhausted and blood-streaked. One of her eyes was blackened and swelling shut, and she had livid bruises all over her body. On top of that, she was covered in dust, and filthy, sweat-lank locks of hair were straggling into her face. But despite all of that, her eyes still held a certain amusement. In case you hadn't noticed, these little costumes of ours are real gold and gems. We happen to be wearing a small fortune in jewelry. Warrior's truth! Tarma looked a good deal more closely at her scanty attire and discovered her partner was right. She grinned with real satisfaction. I guess I owe that damn blade of yours an apology. Only, Kathry grinned back, if we get back into our own clothing before dawn. Why dawn? Because that's when the rightful owners of these trinkets are likely to wake up. I don't think they'd let us keep them when we're found here if they know we have them. Good point. But why should we want anyone to know we're responsible for this mess? Because when the rest of the population scrapes up enough nerve to find out what happened, we're going to be heroines. Or at least we will until they find out how many of their fathers and brothers and husbands were trapped here tonight. By then we'll be long gone, even if they don't reward us. And they might, for delivering the town from a demon. Our reputation has just been made. Tarma's jaw dropped as she realized the truth of that. Shek, she said. Turn me into a sheep. You're right. She threw back her head and laughed into the morning sky. Now all we need is the fortune and a king's blessing. Don't laugh, Oathkin, Cathery replied with a grin. We just might get those, and sooner than you think. After all, aren't we demon slayers? Chapter 8 Someone wrote a song about it. But that was later. Much later. When the dust and dirt were gone from the legend. When the sweat and blood were only memories. And the pain was less than that. And when the dead were all but forgotten, except to their own. Deep into the stony hills, miles from keep or hold, a troop of guards comes riding with a lady and her gold. Riding in the center, shrouded in her cloak of fur, companioned by a maiden and a toothless, aged cur. And every pack train we've sent out for the past two months has vanished without a trace, and without survivors, the silk merchant Grumio concluded, twisting an old iron ring on one finger. Yet the decoy trains were allowed to reach their destinations unmolested. It's uncanny, and if it goes on much longer, we'll be ruined. In the silence that followed his words, he studied the odd pair of mercenaries before him. He knew very well that they knew he was doing so. Eventually, there would be no secrets in this room. Eventually. But he would parcel his out as if they were bits of his heart, and he knew they would do the same. It was all part of the bargaining process. Neither of the two women seemed in any great hurry to reply to his speech. The crackle of the fire behind him in this tiny private eating room sounded unnaturally loud in the absence of conversation. Equally loud were the steady whisking of a whetstone on blade edge and the muted murmur of voices from the common room of the inn beyond their closed door. The whetstone was being wielded by the swordswoman, Tarma by name, who was keeping to her self-appointed task with an indifference to Grumio's words that might or might not be feigned. She sat across the table from him, straddling her bench in a position that left him mostly with a view of her back and the back of her head. 
what little he might have been able to see of her face, was screened by her unruly shock of coarse black hair. He was just as glad of that. There was something about her cold, expressionless, hawk-like face with its wintry blue eyes that sent shivers up his spine. The eyes of a killer, whispered one part of him. Or a fanatic. The other partner cleared her throat, and he gratefully turned his attention to her. Now there was a face a man could easily rest his eyes on. She faced him squarely, this sorceress called Kethry, leaning slightly forward on her folded arms, placing her weight on the table between them. The light from the fire and the oil lamp on their table fell fully on her. A less canny man than Grumio might be tempted to dismiss her as being very much the weaker, the less intelligent of the two. She was always soft of speech, her demeanor refined and gentle. She was very attractive, sweet-faced and quite conventionally pretty, with hair like the finest amber and eyes of beryl green. It would have been very easy to assume that she was no more than the swordswoman's vapid tag-along, a lover, perhaps, maybe one with the right to those mage robes she wore, but surely of no account in the decision-making. That would have been the assessment of most men. But as he'd spoken, Grumio had now and then caught a disquieting glimmer in those calm green eyes. She had been listening quite carefully, and analyzing what she heard. He had not missed the fact that she too bore a sword, and not for the show of it either. That blade had a well-worn scabbard that spoke of frequent use. More than that, what he could see of the blade showed that it was well cared for. The presence of that blade in itself was an anomaly. Most sorcerers never wore more than an eating knife. They simply hadn't the time or the inclination to attempt studying the arts of the swordsman. To Grumio's eyes, the sword looked very odd and quite out of place, slung over the plain, buff-colored, calf-length robe of a wandering sorceress. A puzzlement. Altogether, a puzzlement. I presume, Catherine said when he turned to face her, that the road patrols have been unable to find your bandits. She had in turn been studying the merchant. He interested her. In his own way, he was as much of an anomaly as she and Tarma were. There was muscle beneath the fat of good living, and old sword calluses on his hands. This was no born and bred merchant, not when he looked to be as much retired mercenary as trader. And unless she was wildly mistaken, there was also a sharp mind beneath that balding skull. He knew they didn't come cheaply. Since the demon god affair, their reputation had spread, and their fees had become quite respectable. They were even able, like Iken and Justin, to pick and choose to some extent. On the surface, this business appeared far too simple a task. One would simply gather a short-term army and clean these brigands out. On the surface... This was no job for a specialized team like theirs, and Grumio surely knew that. It followed, then, that there was something more to this tale of banditry than he was telling. Cathery studied him further. Certain signs seemed to confirm this surmise. He looked as though he had not slept well of late, and there seemed to be a shadow of deeper sorrow upon him than the loss of mere goods would account for. She wondered how much he really knew of them, and she paid close attention to what his answer to her question would be. Grumio snorted his contempt for the road patrols. They rode up and down for a few days, never venturing off the trade road, and naturally found nothing. Overdressed, overpaid, underworked, arrogant idiots. Kethry toyed with a fruit left from their supper, and glanced up at the hound-faced merchant through long lashes that veiled her eyes and her thoughts. The next move would be Tarma's. Tarma heard her cue and made her move. Then guard your pack trains, merchant. If guards keep these vermin hidden. He started. Her voice was as harsh as a raven's and startled those not used to hearing it. 
one corner of Tarma's mouth twitched slightly at his reaction. She took a perverse pleasure in using that harshness as a kind of weapon. Ashinain learned to fight with many weapons, words among them. Kalanadril learned the finer use of those weapons. Grumio saw at once the negotiating ploy these two had evidently planned to use with him. The swordswoman was to be the antagonizer, the sorceress, the sympathizer. His respect for them rose another notch. Most freelance mercenaries hadn't the brains to count their pay, much less use subtle bargaining tricks. Their reputation was plainly well-founded. He just wished he knew more of them than their reputation. He was woefully short a full hand in this game. Why, he didn't even know where the sorceress hailed from or what her school was. Be that as it may, once he saw the trick, he had no intention of falling for it. Sword lady, he said patiently, as though to a child. To hire sufficient force requires we raise the price of goods above what people are willing to pay. As he studied them further, he noticed something else about them that was distinctly odd. There was a current of communication and understanding running between these two that had him thoroughly puzzled. He dismissed without a second thought the notion that they might be lovers. The signals between them were all wrong for that. No, it was something else. Something more complicated than that. Something that you wouldn't expect between a Shinain swordswoman and an out clansman. Something, perhaps, that only someone like he was, with experience in dealing with Shinain, would notice in the first place. Tarma shook her head impatiently at his reply. Then cease your interhouse rivalries, Cadessa, and send all your trains together under a single large force. A new ploy. Now she was trying to anger him a little, to get him off guard by insulting him. She had called him a Cadessa, a little grasslands beast that only the Shinain ever saw, a rodent so notoriously greedy that it would, given food enough, eat itself to death and one that was known for hoarding anything and everything it came across in its nest tunnels. Well, it wasn't going to work. He refused to allow the insult to distract him. There was too much at stake here. Respect, sword lady, he replied with a hint of reproachfulness. But we tried that, too. The beasts of the train were driven off in the night, and the guards and traders were forced to return afoot, this is desert country, most of it, and all they dared burden themselves with was food and drink. Leaving the goods behind to be scavenged. Huh. Your bandits are clever, merchant, the swordswoman replied thoughtfully. Grumio thought he could sense her indifference lifting. You mentioned decoy trains, Kethry interjected. Yes, lady. Grumio's mind was still worrying away at the puzzle these two presented. Only I and the men in the train knew which were the decoys and which were not, yet the bandits were never deceived, not once. We had taken extra care that all the men in the train were known to us, too. A glint of gold on the smallest finger of Kethry's left hand finally gave him the clue he needed, and the crescent scar on the palm of that hand confirmed his surmise. He knew without looking that the swordswoman would have an identical scar and ring. These two had sworn Shinain blood oath, the oath of Shianadrin, the strongest bond known to that notoriously king-conscious race. The blood oath made them closer than sisters, closer than lovers, so close they sometimes would think as one. In fact, the word Shianadrin was sometimes translated as two made one. So, who was it that passed judgment on your estimable guards? Tarma's voice was heavy with sarcasm. I did. All my fellow merchants, or our own personal guards. No one was allowed on the trains but those who had served us in the past or were known to those who had. He waited in silence for them to make reply. Tarma held her blade up to catch the firelight and examined her work with a critical eye. Evidently satisfied, she drove it home in the scabbard slung across her back with a fluid, unthinking grace, 
then swung one leg back over the bench to face him as her partner did. Grumio found the unflinching chill of her eyes disconcertingly hard to meet for long. In an effort to find something else to look at, he found his gaze caught by the pendant she wore, a thin silver crescent surrounding a tiny amber flame. That gave him the last bit of information he needed to make everything fall into place, although now he realized that her plain brown clothing should have tipped him off as well, since most Chinain favored wildly colored garments heavy with bright embroideries. Tarma was a sworn one. Kalenidral, pledged to the service of the Shinain warrior, the goddess of the new moon and the south wind. Only three things were of any import to her at all. Her goddess, her people, and her clan, which of course would include her sister by blood oath. The sword sworn were just as sexless and deadly as the weapons they wore. So, why come to us? Tarma's expression indicated she thought their time was being wasted. What makes you think that we can solve your bandit problem? You have a certain reputation, he replied guardedly. A single bark of contemptuous laughter was Tarma's only reply. If you know our reputation, then you also know that we only take those assignments that, shall we say, interest us. Kethry said, looking wide-eyed and innocent. What is there about your problem that could possibly be of any interest to us? Good. They were intrigued at least a little. Now, for the sake of poor little Lena, was the time to hook them and bring them in. His eyes stung a little with tears he would not shed. Not now. Not in front of them. Not until she was avenged. We have a custom... We small merchant houses, our sons must remain with their fathers to learn the trade, and since there are seldom more than two or three houses in any town, there is little in the way of choice for them when it comes time for marriage. For that reason, we are given to exchanging daughters of the proper age with our trade allies in other towns, so that our young people can hopefully find mates to their liking. His voice almost broke at the memory of watching Lena waving goodbye from the back of her little mare but he regained control quickly. It was a poor merchant that could not school his emotions. There were no less than a dozen sheltered, gently reared maidens in the very first pack train they took. One of them was my niece, my only heir, and all that was left of my brother's family after the plague six years ago. He could continue no further. Kathry's breath hissed softly, and Tarma swallowed an oath. Your knowledge of what interests us is very accurate, merchant, Tarma said after a long pause. I congratulate you. You... you accept? Discipline could not keep hope out of his voice. I pray you are not expecting us to rescue your lost ones, Kathry said as gently as she could. Even supposing that the bandits were more interested in slaves to be sold than their own pleasure, which, in my experience, is not likely, there is very, very little chance that any of them still live. The sheltered, the gentle, well, they do not survive shock successfully. When... We knew that the pack train had been taken. We sent agents to comb the slave markets. They returned empty-handed, he replied, with as much stoicism as he could muster. We will not ask the impossible of you. We knew when we sent for you there was no hope for them. No, we ask only that you wipe out this viper's den to ensure that this can never happen to us again, that you make such an example of them that no one dares try this again, and that you grant us revenge for what they have done to us. There, that was his full hand. Would it be enough? His words, and more the tight control of his voice, struck echoes from Tarma's own heart. 
and she did not need to see her partner to know her feelings in the matter. You will have that, merchant lord, she grated, giving him the title of respect. We accept your job, but there are conditions. Sword lady, any conditions you would set, I would gladly meet. Who am I to contest the judgment of those who destroyed the- Hush! Kethry interrupted him swiftly, and cast a wary glance over her shoulder. The less that is said on that subject, the better. I am still not altogether certain that what you were about to name was truly destroyed. It may have been merely banished, and perhaps for no great span of time. It is hardly wise, if the second case is true, to call attention to oneself by speaking its name. Our conditions, merchant, are simple, Tarma continued, outwardly unperturbed. Inwardly, she had uneasy feelings about Dalkarsh, feelings that had her ready to throw herself between Kethry and anything that even looked like a demon. We will, to all appearances, leave on the morrow. You will tell all, including your fellow merchants, that you could not convince us to remain. Tomorrow night, you, and you alone, mind, will bring us, at a meeting place of your choosing, a cart and horse. Now she raised an inquiring eyebrow at Kethry. And the kind of clothing and gear a lady of wealth and blood would be likely to have when traveling. The clothing should fit me. I will be weaving some complicated illusions, and anything I do not have to counterfeit will be of aid to me and make the rest stronger. You might include lots of empty bags and boxes, Kethry finished thoughtfully. Tarma continued. The following morning a fine lady will ride in and order you to include her with your next pack train. You naturally will do your best to dissuade her, as loudly and publicly as possible. Now, your next scheduled trip was, coincidentally enough, for the day after tomorrow. Gromio was plainly impressed. It looked as though he'd decided that Tarma and her partner were even cleverer than he'd thought. Good. The less time you lose, the better off we are. Remember, only you are to be aware that the lady and the pack train are not exactly what they seem to be. If you say one word otherwise to anyone... The merchant suddenly found himself staring at the tip of a very sharp dagger held a scant inch away from his nose. I will personally remove enough of your hide to make both of us slippers. The dagger disappeared from Tarma's hand, as mysteriously as it had appeared. Grumio had been startled, but had not been particularly intimidated. Tarma gave him high marks for that. I do not instruct the weaver in her trade, he replied with a certain dignity, nor do I dictate the setting of a horseshoe to a smith. There is no reason why I should presume to instruct you in your trade either. Then you are a rare beast indeed, merchant. Tarma graced him with one of her infrequent smiles. Most men. Oh, not fellow mercenaries, they know better, but most men we deal with seem to think they know our business better than we simply by virtue of their sex. The smile softened her harsh expression and made it less intimidating, and the merchant found himself smiling back. You are not the only female higher swords I have dealt with, he replied. Many of my trade allies have them as personal retainers. It has often seemed to me that many of those I met have had to be twice as skilled as their male counterparts to receive half the credit. A hit, merchant lord, Kethry acknowledged with open amusement, and a shrewd one at that. Now, where are we to meet you tomorrow night? Grumio paused to think. I have a farmstead. It's deserted now that the harvest is in. It's just outside of town, at the first lane past the crossroad at the south trade road. No one would think it odd for me to pay a visit to it, and the barn is a good place to hide horses and gear. Well enough, Tarma replied. All three rose as one, and Grumio caught the faint clink of brigandine mail from Tarma's direction. 
though there was no outward sign that she wore any such thing beneath her worn leather tunic, brown shirt, and darker breeches. Merchant, Tarma said suddenly. He paused halfway through the door. I too have known loss. You will have your revenge. He shivered at the look in her eyes and left. Well, Tarma asked, shutting the door behind him and leaning her back up against it. Magic's afoot here. It's the only answer to what's been going on. I don't think it's easy to deceive this merchant. He caught on to our divide-and-conquer trick right away. He's no soft money counter either. I saw the sword calluses. Tarma balanced herself on one foot, set the other against the door, and folded her arms. Did he tell us all he knew? I think so. I don't think he held anything back after he played his high card. The niece. He also didn't want us to know how much he valued her. Damn, this is a bad piece of business. Poor bastard. He'd rather, we thought, the loss of goods and trade meant more to him, Cathery replied. They're a secretive lot in many ways, these traders. Almost as secretive as sorceresses, no? One corner of Tarma's thin lips quirked up in a half-smile. The smile vanished as she thought of something else. Is there any chance that any of the women survived? Not to put too fine a point upon it, no. This, Kethry patted the hilt of her sword, would have told me if any of them had. The pull is there, but without the urgency there'd be if there was anyone needing rescue. Still, we need more information, so I might as well add that to the set of questions I intend to ask. Concern flickered briefly in Tarma's eyes. An unprepared summoning? Are you sure you want to risk it? If nothing else, it will wear you down, and you have all those illusions to cast. I think it's worth it. There aren't that many hostile entities to guard against in this area, and I'll have all night to rest afterward, most of tomorrow as well, once we reach that farmstead, and my arsenal is full. My non-personal energies are completely charged, and my other planner alliances doing well. It won't be any problem. You're the magic worker, Tarma sighed. Since we've hired this room for the whole evening, want to make use of it for your magicking? It's bigger than our sleeping room. At Kethry's nod, Tarma pushed the table into a corner, stacking the benches on top of it, while Kethry set the oil lamp on the mantelpiece. Most of the floor space was now cleared. I'll keep watch on the door. Tarma sat on the floor with her back firmly braced against it. Since it opened inward, the entrance was now solidly guarded against all but the most stubborn of intruders. Kathry inscribed a circle on the floor with powders from her belt pouch, chanting under her breath. She used no dramatic or spectacular ceremonies, for she had learned her art in a gentler school than the other sorcerers Tarma had seen. Her powers came from the voluntary cooperation of other planner entities, and she never coerced them into doing her bidding. There were advantages and disadvantages to this. She need not safeguard herself against the deceptions and treacheries of these creatures, but the cost to her in terms of her own energies expended was correspondingly higher. This was particularly true at times when she had no chance to prepare herself for a summoning. It took a great deal of power to attract a being of benign intent, particularly one that did not have a previous alliance with her, and more to convince it that her intent was good. Hence, the circle, meant not to protect her, but to protect what she would call, so that it would know itself unthreatened. As she seated herself within the circle, Tarma shifted her own position until she too was quite comfortable removed one of her hidden daggers, and began honing it with her sharpening stone. After some time there was a stirring in the circle Kethry had inscribed, and Tarma pulled her attention away from her task. Something was beginning to form mistily in front of the seated sorceress. The mist began to revolve into a miniature whirlpool, coalescing into a figure as it did so. As it solidified, 
Tarma could see what seemed to be a jewel-bright desert lizard, but one that stood erect, like a man. It was as tall as a man's arm is long, and had a cranium far larger than any lizard Tarma had ever seen, except perhaps the image of Gervais that Kethry had used to entertain Leha Earden. Firelight winked from its scales in bands of shining colors, topaz and ruby predominating. It was regarding Kethry with intelligence and wary curiosity. Sa asata, Nelan, it said, tilting its head to one side and fidgeting from one foot to the other. Its voice was shrill, like that of a very young child. Vede, sa asarth, Kathri replied in the same tongue, whatever the tongue was. The little creature relaxed and stopped fretting. It appeared to be quite eager to answer all of Kathri's questions. Now that the initial effort of calling it was done with, she had no trouble in obtaining all the information she wanted. Finally, she gave the little creature the fruit she'd been toying with after supper. It snatched the gift greedily, trilled what Tarma presumed to be thanks, and vanished into mist again. When it was completely gone, Kethry rose stiffly and began to scuff the circle into random piles of dirt with the toe of her boot. It's about what I expected, she said. Someone, someone with a smell of magic about him, according to the Kamsin, has organized what used to be several small bands of marauders into one large one of rather formidable proportions. They have no set camp, so we can't arrange for their base to be attacked while they're ambushing us, I'm sorry to say. They have no favored ambush point, so we won't know when to expect them, and none of the women, girls really, survived for more than a day. Oh, hell! Tarma's eyes were shadowed. Well, we didn't really expect anything different. No, but you know damn well we both hoped. Kathry's voice was rough with weariness. It's up to you now, Shianadra. You're the tactician. Then as the tactician, I counsel rest for you. Tarma caught Kathry's shoulders to steady her as she stumbled a little from fatigue. The reaction to spellcasting was setting in fast now. Kathry had once described summoning as being like balancing on a roof tree while screaming an epic poem in a foreign language at the top of your lungs. Small wonder she was exhausted afterward. The sorceress leaned on Tarma's supporting shoulder with silent gratitude as her partner guided her up the stairs to their rented sleeping room. It's us, Whirl. Tarma called softly at the door. A muted growl answered her, and they could hear the sound of the bolt being shoved back. Tarma pushed the door open with one foot and picked up one of the unlit tallow candles that waited on a shelf just inside with her free hand. She lit it at the one in the bracket outside their door, and the light from it fell on Worrell's head and shoulders. He stood, tongue lolling out in a lupine grin just inside the room. He sniffed inquisitively at them, making a questioning whine deep in his throat. Yes, we took the job. That's our employer you smell, so don't mangle him when he shows up tomorrow night. And kethry has been summoning, of course, so as usual she's half dead. Close the door behind us while I put her to bed. By now, Kethry was nearly asleep on her feet. After some summonings, Tarma had seen her pass into unconsciousness while still walking. Tarma undressed her with the gentle and practiced hands of a nursemaid, and got her safely into bed before she had the chance to fall over. The Kyrie, meanwhile, had butted the door shut with his head and pushed the bolt home with his nose. Any trouble? Tarma asked him. He snorted with derision. Well, I didn't really expect any either. This is the quietest inn I've been in for a long time. The job is bandits, Harry One, and we're all going to have to go disguised. That includes you. He whined in protest, ears down. I know you don't like it, but there's no choice. There isn't enough cover along the road to hide a bird, and I want you close at hand, within a few feet of us at all times. 
not wandering out in the desert somewhere. The Kairi sighed heavily, padded over to her, and laid his heavy head in her lap to be scratched. I know, I know, she said, obliging him. I don't like it any more than you do. Just be grateful that all we'll be wearing is illusions, even if they do make the backs of our eyes itch. Poor Catherine's going to have to ride muffled head to toe like a fine lady. Worrell obviously didn't care about poor Catherine. You're being very unfair to her, you know. And you're supposed to have been her familiar, not mine. You're a magic beast born out of magic. You belong with a spellcaster, not some clod with a sword. Worrell was not impressed with Tarma's logic. She doesn't need me. He spoke mind to mind with the swordswoman. She has the spirit sword. You need me. I've told you that before. And that, so far as Worrell was concerned, was that. Well, I'm not going to argue with you. I never argue with anyone with as many sharp teeth as you've got. Maybe being Kalenadrol counts as being magic. She pushed Worrell's head off her lap and went to open the shutters to the room's one window. Moonlight flooded the room. She seated herself on the floor where it would fall on her, just as she did every night when there was a moon and she wasn't ill or injured. Since they were within the walls of a town and not camped, she would not train this night. But the moon paths were there as always, waiting to be walked. She closed her eyes and found them. Walking them was, as she'd often told Kethry, impossible to describe. When she returned to her body, Worrell was lying patiently at her back, waiting for her. She ruffled his fur with a grin, stood, stretched stiffened muscles, then stripped to a shift and climbed in beside Kethry. Worrell sighed with gratitude and took his usual spot at her feet. Three things see no end, a flower blighted ere it bloomed, a message that was wasted, and a journey that was doomed. The two mercenaries rode out of town in the morning, obviously eager to be gone. Grumia watched them leave, gazing sadly at the cloud of dust they raised, his hound-like face clearly displaying his disappointment. His fellow merchants were equally disappointed when he told them of his failure to persuade them. They had all hoped the women would be the solution to their problem. After sundown, Grumio took a cart and horse out to his farmstead, a saddled riding beast tied to the rear of it. After making certain that no one had followed him, he drove directly into the barn and peered around in the hay-scented gloom. A fear crossed his mind that the women had tricked him and had truly left that morning. Don't fret yourself, merchant, said a gravelly voice just above his head. He jumped, his heart racing. We're here. A vague figure swung down from the loft. When it came close enough for him to make out features, he stared at the sight of a buxom blonde wearing the swordswoman's clothing. She grinned at his reaction. Which one am I? She didn't tell me, blonde? He nodded, amazed. Male bait again. Good choice, no one would ever think I knew what a blade was for, or that I ever thought of anything but men and clothing, not necessarily in that order. You don't want to see my partner. Her voice was still in Tarma's gravelly tones. Grumio assumed that that was only so he'd recognize her. We don't want you to have to strain your acting ability tomorrow. Did you bring everything we asked for? It's all here, he replied, still not believing what his eyes were telling him. I weighted the boxes with sand and stones so that they won't seem empty. You've got a good head on you, merchant. Tarma saluted him as she unharnessed the horse. That's something I didn't think of. Best you leave now, though, before somebody comes looking for you. He jumped down off the wagon, taking the reins of his riding beast. And merchant, she called as he rode off into the night. Wish us luck. He didn't have to act the next morning when a delicate and aristocratically frail lady of obvious noble birth accosted him in his shop and ordered him, although it was framed as a request, to include her in his pack train.
In point of fact, had he not recognized the dress and fur cloak she was wearing, he would have taken her for a real Aristo, one who, by some impossible coincidence, had taken the same notion into her head that the swordswoman had proposed as a ruse. This sylph-like, sleepy-eyed creature with her elaborately coiffed hair of platinum silk bore no resemblance at all to the very vibrant and earthy sorceress he'd hired. And though he was partially prepared by having seen her briefly the night before, Tarma, posing as milady's maid, still gave him a shock. He saw why she called the disguise male-bait. This amply endowed blonde was a walking invitation to impropriety, and nothing like the sexless sworn one. All that remained of Tarma were the blue eyes, one of which winked cheerfully at him to bring him out of his shock. Grumio argued vehemently with the high-born dame for the better part of an hour, and all to no avail. Undaunted, he carried his expostulations out into the street, still trying to persuade her to change her mind, even as the pack train formed up in front of his shop. The entire town was privy to the argument by that time. Lady, I beg you, reconsider, he was saying anxiously. Wait for the king's patrol. They have promised to return soon and in force, since the bandits have not ceased raiding us and are morally certain they'll be willing to escort you. My thanks for your concern, merchant, she replied, with a gentle and bored haughtiness, but I fear my business cannot wait till their return. Besides, what is there about me that could possibly tempt a bandit? Those whose ears were stretched to catch this conversation could easily sympathize with Grumio's silent but obvious plea to the gods for patience as they noted the lady's jewels, fine garments, the weight of the cart holding her possessions, and the well-bred mares she and her maid rode. The lady turned away from him before he could continue, a clear gesture of dismissal. So he held his tongue. In stony silence, he watched the train form up, with the lady and her maid in the center. Since they had no driver for the cart, though he'd offered to supply one, the lead rein of the cart horse had been fastened to the rear pack horse's harness. Surmounting the chests and boxes in the cart was a toothless old dog, apparently supposed to be guarding her possessions and plainly incapable of guarding anything any more. The leader of the train's six guards took his final instructions from his master, and the train lurched off down the trade road. As Grumio watched them disappear into the distance, he could be seen to shake his head in disapproval. Had anyone been watching very closely, though no one was, they might have noticed the lady's fingers moving in a complicated pattern. Had there been any mages present, which wasn't the case, said mage might have recognized the pattern as belonging to the spell of true sight. If illusion was involved, it would not be blinding Kethry. One among the guardsmen has a shifting, restless eye, and as they ride, he scans the hills that rise against the sky. He wears a sword and bracelet worth more than he can afford, and hidden in his baggage is a heavy, secret hoard. One of the guards was contemplating the lady's assets with a glee and greed that equaled his master's dismay. His expression, carefully controlled, seemed to be remote and impassive. Only his rapidly shifting gaze and the nervous flicker of his tongue over dry lips gave any clue to his thoughts. Behind those remote eyes, a treacherous mind was making a careful inventory of every jewel and visible possession and calculating their probable values. When the lady's skirt lifted briefly to display a tantalizing glimpse of white leg, his control broke enough that he bit his lip. She was one prize he intended to reserve for himself. He'd never been this close to a high-born woman before, and he intended to find out if certain things he'd heard about betting them were true. 
the others were going to have to be content with the ample charms of the serving maid, at least until he'd tired of the mistress. At least there wouldn't be all that caterwauling and screeching there'd been with the merchant wenches. That maid looked as if she'd had a man betwixt her legs plenty of times before, and enjoyed it, too. She'd probably thank him for livening up her life when he turned her over to the men. He had thought at first that this was going to be another trap, especially after he'd heard that old Grumio had tried to hire a pair of highly touted mercenary women to rid him of the bandits. One look at the lady and her maid, however, had convinced him that not only was it absurd to think that they could be wary hire swords in disguise, but that they probably didn't even know which end of a blade to hold. The wench flirted and teased each of the men in turn. Her mind was obviously on something other than ambushes and weaponry, unless those ambushes were amorous and the weaponry of flesh. The lady herself seemed to ride in a half-aware dream, and her minder often had to break off a flirtation in order to ride forward and steady her in the saddle. Perhaps she was a trandust sniffer. Or there was faldus juice mixed in with the water in the skin on her saddle bow. That would be an unexpected bonus. She was bound to have a good supply of it among her belongings, and drugs were worth more than jewels and it would be distinctly interesting, his eyes glinted cruelly, to have her begging him on her knees for her drugs as withdrawal set in, assuming, of course, that she survived that long. He passed his tongue over lips gone dry with anticipation. Tomorrow, he would give the scouts trailing the pack train the signal to attack. Of three things be wary, of a feather on a cat, the shepherd eating mutton, and the guardsman that is fat. The lady and her companion made camp a discreet distance from the rest of the caravan, as was only to be expected. She would hardly have a taste for sharing their rough camp, rude talk, or coarse food. Catherine's shoulders sagged with fatigue beneath the weight of her heavy cloak, and she was chilled to the bone in spite of its fur lining. Are you all right? Tarma whispered sharply, when she hadn't spoken for several minutes. Just tired. I never thought that holding up five illusions would be so hard. Three aren't half so difficult to keep intact. She leaned her forehead on one hand, rubbing her temples with cold fingers. I wish it was over. Tarma pressed a bowl into her other hand. Dutifully, she tried to eat, but the sand and dust that had plagued their progress all day had crept into the food as well. It was too dry and gritty to swallow easily, and after one attempt, Kethry felt too weary to make any further effort. She laid the bowl aside, unobtrusively, or so she hoped. Faint hope. Sweeting, if you don't eat by yourself, I'm going to pry your mouth open and pour your dinner down your throat. Tarma's expression was cloyingly sweet, and the tone of her shifted voice dulcet. Kathry was roused enough to smile a little. When she was this wearied with the exercise of her magics, she had to be bullied into caring for herself. When she'd been on her own, She'd sometimes had to spend days recovering from the damages she'd inflicted on her body by neglecting it. Tarma had her badly worried lately with all the cosseting she'd been doing, like she was trying to keep Kethry wrapped safely in lamb's wool all the time. But at this moment, Kethry was rather glad to have the cosseting. In fact, it was at moments like this that she valued Tarma's untiring affection and aid the most. What, and ruin our disguises, she retorted, with a little more life. There's nothing at all out of the ordinary in an attentive maid helping a poor, sick mistress to eat. They already think there's something wrong with you. Half of them think you're ill, the other half think you're in a drug daze. Tarma replied, they all think you've got nothing between your ears but air. Kethry capitulated, picked up her dinner, and forced it down, grit and all. Now, Tarma said, when they'd both finished eating, 
I know you've spotted a suspect. I can tell by the way you're watching the guards. Tell me which one it is. I'd be very interested to see if it's the same one I've got my eye on. It's the one with the mouse-brown hair and ratty face that rode tail guard this morning. Tarma's eyes widened a little, but she gave no other sign of surprise. Did you say brown hair and a ratty face? Tail guard this morning had black hair and a pouty, babyish look to him. Kethry revived a bit more. Really? Are you talking about the one walking between us and their fire right now? The one with all the jewellery? And does he seem to be someone you know very vaguely? Yes. One of the hired swords with the horse traders my clan used to deal with. I think his name was Tedrick. Why? Kethry unbuckled a small ornamental dagger from her belt and passed it to Tarma with exaggerated care. Tarma claimed it with the same caution. Caution that was quite justified, since the dagger was in reality Kethry's sword need, no matter what shape it wore at the moment. Beneath the illusion, it still retained its original mass and weight. Now look at him. Tarma cast a surreptitious glance at the guard again, and her lips tightened. Even when it was done by magic, she didn't like being tricked. Mouse brown hair and a ratty face, she said. He changed. She returned the blade to Kethry. And now, Kethry asked, when Need was safely back on her belt. Now that's odd, Tarma said thoughtfully. If he's using an illusion, he should have gone back to the way he looked before, but he didn't. He's still mousy and ratty. But my eyes feel funny, like something's pulling at them, and he's blurred a bit around the edges. It's almost as if his face was trying to look different from what I'm seeing. Uh-huh. Mind magic, Kethry said with satisfaction. So that's why I wasn't able to detect any spells. It's not a true illusion like I'm holding on us. They practice mind magic a lot more up north in Valdemar. I think I must have told you about it at some time or other. I'm only marginally familiar with the way it works, since it doesn't operate quite like what I've learned. If what I've been told is true, his mind is telling your mind that you know him, and letting your memory supply an acceptable face. He could very well look like a different person to everyone in the caravan, but since he always looks familiar, any of them would be willing to vouch for him. Which is how he keeps sneaking into the pack trains. He looks different each time, since no one is likely to see a man they know is dead. Very clever. You say this isn't a spell? Mind magic depends on inborn abilities to work. If you haven't got them, you can't learn it. It's unlike my magic, where it's useful to have the gift but not necessary. Was he the same one you were watching? He is indeed. So, your true sight spell works on this mind magic too? Yes, thank the gods. I'm glad now I didn't rely on mage sight. He would have fooled that. What tipped you off to him? Nothing terribly obvious. Just a lot of little things that weren't quite right for the ordinary guard he's pretending to be. His sword is a shade too expensive. His horse has been badly misused, but he's a gelding of very good lines. He's of much better breeding than a common guard should own. And, lastly, he's wearing jewellery he can't afford. Kethry looked puzzled. Several of the other guards are wearing just as much. I thought most hired swords wore their savings. So they do. Thing is, of the others, the only ones with as much or more are either the guard chief or ones wearing mostly brass and glass, showy meant to impress village tarts, but worthless. His is all real, and the quality is high. Too damned high for the likes of him. Now that we know who to watch, what do we do? We wait, Tarma replied with a certain grim satisfaction.
He'll have to signal the rest of his troop to attack us sooner or later, and one of us should be able to spot him at it. With luck and the warrior on our side, we'll have enough warning to be ready for them. I hope it's sooner. Kathry sipped at the well-watered wine, which was all she'd allow herself when holding spells in place. Her eyes were heavy, dry, and sore. I'm not sure how much longer I can hold up my end. Then go to sleep, dearling. Tarma's voice held an unusual gentleness, a gentleness only Kethry, Worrell, and small children ever saw. Furface and I can take turns on night watch. You needn't take a turn at all. Kethry did not need further urging, but wrapped herself up in her cloak and a blanket, pillowed her head on her arm, and fell asleep with the suddenness of a tired puppy. The illusions she'd woven would remain intact even while she slept. Only three things could cause them to fail. They'd break if she broke them herself, if the pressure of spells from a greater sorcerer than she were brought to bear on them, or if she died. Her training had been arduous, and quite thorough, as complete in its way as Tarma's sword training had been. Seeing her shiver in her sleep, Tarma built up the fire with a bit more dried dung. The leavings of previous caravans were all the fuel to be found out here, and covered her with the rest of the spare blankets. The illusions were draining energy from Kethry, and she got easily chilled. Tarma didn't expect to need the other coverings. She knew she'd be quite comfortable with one blanket and her cloak, and if that didn't suffice, Worrell made an excellent bed warmer. Warrior, guard her back she prayed, as she had every night lately. I can guard my own, but keep her safe. But the night passed uneventfully, despite Tarma's vague worries. Morning saw them riding deeper into the stony hills that ringed the desert basin they'd spent the day before passing through. The road was considerably less dusty now, but the air held more of a chill. Both Tarma and Kethry tried to keep an eye on their suspect guard, and shortly before noon, their vigilance was rewarded. Both of them saw him flashing the sunlight off his armband in what could only be a deliberate series of signals. From ambush, bandits screaming charge the pack train and its prize, and all but four within the train are taken by surprise, and all but four are cut down like a woodsman fells a log, the guardsman and the lady and the maiden, and the dog. Three things know a secret. First, the lady in a dream, the dog that barks no warning, and the maid that does not scream. Even with advance warning, they hadn't much time to ready themselves. Bandits charged the pack train from both sides of the road, screaming at the tops of their lungs. The guards were taken completely by surprise. The three apprentice traders accompanying the train flung themselves down on their faces as their master Grumio had ordered them to do, in hopes that they'd be overlooked. To the bandit master at the rear of the train, it seemed that once again all had gone completely according to plan, until Kethry broke her illusions. Then off the lady pulls her cloak, in armor she is clad, her sword is out and ready, and her eyes are fierce and glad. The maiden gestures briefly, and the dogs occur no more. A wolf, sword maid and sorceress, now face the bandit corps. Three things never anger, or you will not live for long. A wolf with cubs, a man with power, and a woman's sense of wrong." The brigands at the forefront of the pack found themselves facing something they hadn't remotely expected. Gone were the helpless, frightened women on high-bred steeds too fearful to run. In their place sat a pair of well-armed, grim-faced mercenaries on schooled war beasts. With them was an oversized and very hungry-looking Kyrie. The pack of bandits milled, brought to a halt by this unexpected development. Finally, one of the bigger ones growled a challenge at Tarma, who only grinned evilly at him. Kathry saluted them with mocking gallantry, and the pair moved into action explosively. They split up and charged the marauders, 
giving them no time to adjust to the altered situation. The bandits had hardly expected the fight to be carried to them and reacted too late to stop them. Their momentum carried them through the pack and up onto the hillsides on either side of the road. Now they had the high ground. Kethry had drawn need whose magic was enabling her to keep herself intact long enough to find a massive boulder to put her back against. The long odds were actually favoring the two of them for the moment, since the bandits were mostly succeeding only in getting in each other's way. Obviously, they had not been trained to fight together, and had done well so far largely because of the surprise with which they'd attacked and their sheer numbers. Once Kethry had gained her chosen spot, she slid off her horse and sent it off with a slap to its rump. The mottled, huge-headed beast was as ugly as a piece of rough granite and twice as tough, but she was a Shinain bred and trained war steed and worth the weight in silver of the high-bred mare she'd been spelled to resemble. Now that Kathry was on the ground, she'd attack anything whose scent she didn't recognize and quite probably kill it. Worrell came to her side long enough to give her the time she needed to transfer her sword to her left hand and begin calling up her more arcane, offensive weaponry. In the meantime, Tarma was in her element, cutting a bloody swath through the bandit horde with a fiercely joyous gleam in her eyes. She clenched her mare's belly with vice-like legs. Only one trained in Shinain-style horse warfare from childhood could possibly have stayed with the beast. The mare was laying all about her with iron-shod hooves and enormous yellow teeth. Neither animal nor man was likely to escape her once she'd targeted him. She had an uncanny sense for anyone trying to get to her rider by disabling her. Once, she twisted and bucked like a cat on hot metal to simultaneously crush the bandit in front of her while kicking in the teeth of the one that had thought to hamstring her from the rear. She accounted for at least as many of the bandits as Tarma did. Tarma saw Kethry's mare rear and slash out of the corner of her eye. The saddle was empty. She sent a brief worried thought at Worrell. Guard yourself, foolish child. She's doing better than you are, came the mental rebuke. Tarma grimaced, realizing she should have known better. The bond of Shienadrin made them bound by spirit, and she'd have known if anything was wrong. Since the mare was fighting on her own, Kethry must have found some place high enough to see over the heads of those around her. As if to confirm this, things like ball lightning began appearing and exploding, knocking bandits from their horses. Clouds of red mist began to wreath the heads of others, who clutched their throats and turned interesting colors, and oddly formed creatures joined Worrell at harrying and biting at those on foot. When that began, especially after one spectacular fireball left a pile of smoking ash in place of the bandit's second-in-command, it was more than the remainder of the band could stand up to. Their easy prey had turned into hellspawn, and there was nothing that could make them stay to face anything more. The ones that were still mounted turned their horses out of the melee and fled for their lives. Tarma and the three surviving guards took care of the rest. As for the bandit chief, who had sat his horse in stupefied amazement from the moment the fight turned against them, he suddenly realized his own peril and tried to escape with the rest. Kethry, however, had never once forgotten him. Her bolt of power, intended this time to stun, not kill, took him squarely in the back of the head. The bandits growl a challenge, but the lady only grins, the sorceress bows mockingly, and then the fight begins. When it ends, there are but four, left standing from that horde, the witch, the wolf, the traitor, and the woman with the sword. Three things never trust in, the maiden sworn as pure, the vows a king has given, and the ambush that is sure." By late afternoon, the heads of the bandits had been piled in a grisly cairn by the side of the road, as a mute reminder to their fellows of the eventual reward of banditry. Their bodies had been dragged off into the hills for the scavengers to quarrel over. Tarma had supervised the cleanup, the three apprentices serving as her workforce. 
There had been a good deal of stomach purging on their part at first, especially after the way Tarma had casually lopped off the heads of the dead or wounded bandits, but they'd obeyed her without question. Tarma had had to hide her snickering behind her hand, for they looked at her whenever she gave them a command as though they feared that their heads might well adorn the cairn if they lagged or slacked. She herself had seen to the wounds of the surviving guards and the burial of the two dead ones. One of the guards could still ride. The other two were loaded into the now useless cart after the empty boxes had been thrown out of it. Tarma ordered the whole caravan back to town. She and Kethry planned to catch up with them later, after some unfinished business had been taken care of. Part of that unfinished business was the filling and marking of the dead guard's graves. Kethry brought her a rag to wipe her hands with when she'd finished. Damn! I wish— Oh, hell, Spawn, they were just honest hired swords, she said looking at the stone cairns she'd built with remote regret. It wasn't their fault we didn't have a chance to warn them. Maybe they shouldn't have let themselves be surprised like that. Not with what's been happening to the pack trains lately, but still, your life's a pretty heavy price to pay for a little carelessness. Catherine, her energy back to normal now that she was no longer being drained by her illusions, slipped a sympathetic arm around Tarma's shoulders. Come on, Shianidra. I want to show you something that might make you feel a little better. While Tarma had gone to direct the cleanup, Kethry had been engaged in stripping the bandit chief down to his skin and readying his unconscious body for some sort of involved sorcery. Tarma knew she'd had some sort of specific punishment in mind from the time she'd heard about the stolen girls, but she'd had no idea of what it was. They've stripped the traitor naked, and they've whipped him on his way, into the barren hillsides like the folk he used to slay. They take a thorough vengeance for the women he's cut down, and then they mount their horses, and they journey back to town. Three things trust and cherish well, the horse on which you ride, the beast that guards and watches, and your sister at your side. Now before her was a bizarre sight. Tied to the back of one of the bandits' abandoned horses was, apparently, the unconscious body of the high-born lady Kethry had spelled herself to resemble. She was clad only in a few rags and had a bruise on one temple, but otherwise looked to be unharmed. Tarma circled the tableau slowly. There was no flaw in the illusion, if indeed it was an illusion. Unbelievable! she said at last. That is him, isn't it? Oh, yes, indeed. One of my best pieces of work. Will it hold without you around to maintain it? It'll hold all right, Kethry replied with deep satisfaction. That's part of the beauty and the justice of the thing. The illusion is irretrievably melded with his own mind magic. He'll never be able to break it himself, and no reputable sorcerer will break it for him, and I promise you, the only sorcerers for weeks in any direction are quite reputable. Why wouldn't he be able to get one to break it for him? Because I've signed it. Catherine made a small gesture, and two symbols appeared for a moment above the bandit's head. One was the symbol Tarma knew to be Catherine's sigil. The other was the glyph for justice. Any attempt to probe the spell will make those appear. I doubt that anyone will ignore the judgment sign, and even if they were inclined to, I think my reputation is good enough to make most sorcerers think twice about undoing what I've done. You really didn't change him, did you? Tarma asked, a horrible thought occurring to her. I mean, if he's really a woman now... Bright lady, what an awful paradox we'd have, Catherine laughed, easing Tarma's mind considerably. We punish him for what he's done to women by turning him into a woman, but as a woman, we'd now be on a bound to protect him. No, don't worry. Under the illusion, and it's a very complete illusion, by the way, it extends to all senses, 
he's still quite male. She gave the horse's rump a whack, breaking the light enchantment that had held it quiet, and it bucked a little, scrabbling off into the barren hills. The last of the band went that way, she said, pointing after the beast, and the horse he's on will follow their scent back to where they've made their camp. Of course, none of his former followers will have any notion that he's anything other than what he appears to be. A wicked smile crept across Tarma's face. It matched the one already curving Kethry's lips. I wish I could be there when he arrives, Tarma said, with a note of viciousness in her harsh voice. It's bound to be interesting. He'll certainly get exactly what he deserves. Kathry watched the horse vanish over the crest of the hill. I wonder how he'll like being on the receiving end. I know somebody who will like this, and I can't wait to see his face when you tell him. Grumio? Mm-hmm. You know, Kathry replied thoughtfully, this was almost worth doing for free. She Anadra! Tarma exclaimed in mock horror. Your misplaced honor will have us starving yet. We're supposed to be mercenaries. I said almost. Kathry joined in her partner's gravelly laughter. Come on, we've got pay to collect. You know, this just might end up as some bard song. <laughs> it might at that, Tarma chuckled. And what will you bet me that he gets the tale all wrong? Not only that, but given bards, I can almost guarantee that it will only get worse with age. Chapter 9 The aged half-blind mage blinked confused, roomy eyes at his visitor. The man, or was it woman, looked as awful as the mage felt. Bloodshot and dark-circled eyes glared at him from under the concealing shelter of a moth-eaten hood and several scarves. A straggle of hair that looked first to be dirty mouse-brown, then silver-blonde, then brown again, strayed into those staring eyes. Nor did the eyes stay the same from one moment to the next. They turned blue, then hazel, then back to amethyst blue. Try as he would, the mage could not make his own eyes focus properly, and the light from a lanthorn held high in one of the visitor's hands was doing nothing to alleviate his befuddlement. The mage had never seen a human that presented such a contradictory appearance. She, he, was a shapeless bundle of filthy, lice-ridden rags. What flesh there was to be seen displayed the yellow-green of healing bruises. Yet he had clearly seen gold pass to the hands of his landlord when that particular piece of human offal had unlocked the mage's door. Gold didn't come often to this part of town, and it came far less often borne by a hand clothed in rags. He, she, had forced his, her, way into the verminous garret hole that was all the mage could call home now without so much as a by your leave— shouldering the landlord aside and closing the door firmly afterward. So this stranger was far more interested in privacy than in having the landlord there as a possible backup in case the senile wizard proved recalcitrant. That was quite enough to bewilder the mage, but the way his visitor kept shifting from male to female and back again was bidding fair to dizzy what few wits still remained to him and was nearly leaving him too muddled to speak. Besides that, the shape-shifting was giving him one god's awful headache. Go away, he groaned feelingly, shadowing his eyes both from the unsettling sight and from the too bright glare of the lanthorn, his visitor still held aloft. Leave an old man alone. I haven't got a thing left to steal. He was all too aware of his pitiful state, his robe stained and frayed, his long gray beard snarled and unkempt, his eyes so bloodshot and yellowed that no one could tell their color anymore. He was housed in an equally pitiful manner 
This garret room had been rejected by everyone, no matter how poor, except himself. It was scarcely better than sleeping in the street. It leaked when it rained, turned into an oven in summer and a meat locker in winter, and the wind whistled through cracks in the walls big enough to stick a finger in. His only furnishings were a pile of rags that served as a bed and a rickety stool. Beneath him he could feel the ramshackle building swaying in the wind, and the movement was contributing to his headache. The boards of the walls creaked and complained, each in a different key. He knew he should have been used to it by now, but he wasn't. The crying wood rasped his nerves raw and added mightily to his disorientation. The multiple drafts made the lanthorn flame flicker, even inside its glass chimney. The resulting dancing shadows didn't help his befuddlement. I'm not here to steal, old fraud. Even the voice of the visitor was a confusing amalgam of male and female. I've brought you something. The other hand emerged from the rags, bearing an unmistakable emerald green bottle. The hand jiggled the bottle a little, and the contents sloshed enticingly. The rag slipped, and a trifle more of his visitor's face was revealed. But the mage was only interested now in the bottle. Lethe. He forgot his perplexity, his befogged mind, and his headache as he hunched forward on his pallet of decaying rags, reaching eagerly for the bottle of drug wine that had been his downfall. Every cell ached for the blessed, damned touch of it. Oh, no, the visitor backed out of reach and the mage felt the shame of weak tears spilling down his cheeks. First, you give me what I want. Then, I give you this. The mage sagged back into his pile of rags. I have nothing. It's not what you have, old fraud. It's what you were. What I was? You were a mage, and a good one or so they claim. That was before you let this stuff rob you of your wits until they cast you out of the guild to rot. But there damn well ought to be enough left of you for my purposes. By steadfastly looking not at the visitor, but at the bottle, the mage was managing to collect his scattering thoughts. What purpose? The visitor all but screamed his answer. To take off this curse, old fool! Are your wits so far gone you can't even see what's in front of you? A curse, of course. No wonder his visitor kept shifting and changing. It wasn't the person that was shifting, but his own sight, switching erratically between normal vision and mage sight. Normal vision showed him the woman. When the rag slipped a little more, she seemed to be a battered but still lovely little toy of a creature, amethyst-eyed and platinum-haired. Mage sight showed him an equally abused but far from lovely man, sallow and thin, battered but by no means beaten, a man wearing the kind of smoldering scowl that showed he was holding in rage by the thinnest of bonds. So the curse could only be illusion, but a very powerful and carefully cast illusion. There was something magic-smelling about the man-woman, too. The illusion was linked to and being fueled by that magic. The mage furrowed his brow, then tested the weave of the magic that formed the illusion. It was a more than competent piece of work, and it was complete to all senses. It was far superior to anything the mage had produced even in his best days. In his present condition, to duplicate it so that he could lay new illusion over old would be impossible. To turn it or transfer it beyond even his former level of skill. He never even considered trying to take it off. To break it was beyond the best mage in Oberdorn, much less the broken-down wreck he had become. Eyeing the bottle with passionate longing and despair, he said as much. To his surprise, the man accepted the bad news with a nod. That's what they told me, he said. But they told me something else. What a human mage couldn't break, a demon might. Ah, uh, demon? The mage licked his lips. 
The bottle of Lethe was again within his grasp. I used to be able to summon demons. I still could, I think, but it wouldn't be easy. That was untrue. The summoning of demons had been one of his lesser skills. It was still easily within his capabilities. But it required specialized tools and ingredients he no longer had the means to procure. And it was prescribed by the guild. He'd tried to raise a minor impling to steal him lethe wine when his money had run out. That was when the guild had discovered what he'd fallen prey to. That was the main reason they'd cast him out, destroying his tools and books. A mage brought so low as to use his skills for personal theft was no longer trustworthy, especially not one that could summon demons. Demons were clever and had the minds of sharp lawyers when it came to wriggling out of the bonds that had been set on them. That was why raising them was prescribed for any single mage of the guild, and doubly prescribed for one who might have doubts as to his own mental competence at the time of the conjuration. Of course, he was no longer bound by guild laws since he was outcast, and if this stranger could provide the wherewithal, the tools, and the supplies— it could be easily done. Just tell me what you need, old man. I'll get it for you. The haggard, grimy face was avid, eager. You bring me a demon to break this curse, and the bottle's yours. Two days later, they stood in the cellar of the old rotten mansion whose garret the mage called home. The cellar was in no better repair than the rest of the house. It was moldy and stank, and watermarks on the walls showed why no one cared to live there. Not only did the place flood every time it rained, but moisture was constantly seeping through the walls, and water trickled down from the roof cisterns to drip from the beams overhead. Bright sparks of light glinted just beyond the circle of illumination cast by the lanthorn, the gleaming eyes of starveling rats and mice perched curiously on the decaying shelves that clung to the walls. The scratching of their claws seemed to echo the scratching of the mage's chalks on the cracked slate floor. The man-woman sat impatiently on the remains of a cask off to one side, careful not to disturb the work at hand. It had already cost him dearly, in gold and blood. Some of the things the mage had demanded had been bought, but most had been stolen. The former owners were often no longer in a condition to object to the disposition of their property. From time to time the mage would glance searchingly up at him, make a tiny motion with his hand, frown with concentration, then return to his drawing. After the fourth time this had happened, the stranger wet his lips with a nervous tongue and asked, "'Why do you keep doing that?' Looking at me, I mean? The mage blinked and stood up slowly, his back aching from the strain of staying bent over for so long. His red-rimmed, teary eyes focused to one side of the man, for he still found it difficult to look directly at him. It's the spell that's on you, he replied after a moment to collect his thoughts. I don't know of a demon strong enough to break a spell that well made. The man jumped to his feet, reaching for a sword he had left back in the mage's room because the old man had warned him against bearing cold steel into a demon's presence. You old bastard, he snarled. You told me. I told you I could call one, and I can. I just don't know one. Your best chance is... If I can call a demon with a specific grudge against the maker of the spell. What if there isn't one? There will be, the mage shrugged. Anyone who goes about laying curses like yours and leaving justice glyphs behind to seal them is bound to have angered either a demon or someone who commands one. At any rate, since you want to know, I've been testing the edges of your curse to make the mage rune appear. 
am working that into the summoning. Since I don't know which demon to call, the summoning will take longer than usual to bear fruit, but the results will be the same. The demon will appear, one with a reason to help you, and you'll bargain with it for the breaking of your curse. Me? The stranger was briefly taken aback. Why me? Why not you? Because it isn't my curse. I don't give a damn whether it's broken or not. I told you I'd summon a demon. I didn't say I'd bind him. That takes more skill and certainly more will than I possess any more. My bargain with you was simple. One demon, one bottle of Lethe. Once it's here, you can do your own haggling. The man smiled. It was far more of a grimace than an expression of pleasure. All right, old fraud, work your spell. I'd sooner trust my wits than yours anyway. The mage returned to his scribbling, filling the entire area, lit by lanterns suspended overhead with odd little drawings and scrolls that first pulled, then repelled the eyes. Finally, he seemed satisfied, gathered his stained, ragged robes about him with care, and picked a dainty path through the maze of chalk. He stood up straight, just on the border of the inscriptions, raised his arms high, and intoned a peculiarly resonant chant. At that moment he bordered on the impressive, though the effect was somewhat spoiled by the water dripping off the beams of the ceiling, falling onto his balding head and running off the end of his long nose. The last syllable echoed from the dank walls. The man-woman waited in anticipation. Nothing happened. Well, the stranger said with slipping patience, is that all there is to it? I told you it would take time, perhaps as much as an hour. Don't fret yourself, you'll have your demon. The mage cast longing glances at the shadow-shrouded bottle on the floor beside his visitor as he mopped his head with one begrimed, stained sleeve. The man-woman noted the direction his attention was laid, thought for a moment, weighing the mage's efforts, and smiled mirthlessly. All right, old fraud, I guess you've earned it. Come and get it. The mage didn't wait for a second invitation, or give the man-woman a chance to take the reluctant consent back. He scrambled forward, tripping over the tattered edges of his robes, and sagged to his knees as he snatched the bottle greedily. He had it open in a trice, and began sucking at the neck like a calf at the udder, eyes closing and face slackening in mindless ecstasy. Within moments he was near collapsing to the floor, half-empty bottle cradled in his arms, oblivion in his eyes. His visitor walked over with a softly sinister tread and prodded him with a toe. You'd better have work this right, you old bastard, he muttered or you won't be waking. His last words were swallowed in the sudden roar, like the howl of a tornado that rose without warning behind him. As he spun to face the area of inscriptions, that whole section of floor burst into sickening blood-red and hellish green flame, flame that scorched his face, though it did nothing to harm the beams of the ceiling. He jumped back, frightened in spite of his bold resolutions to fear nothing. But before he touched the ground again, a monstrous, clawed hand formed itself out of the flame and slapped him back against the rear wall of the cellar. A second hand, the color of molten bronze, reached for the oblivious mage. A face worse than anything from the realm of nightmare materialized from the flame between the two hands. A neck, arms, and torso followed. The hands brought the mage within the fire. The visitor coughed on the stench of the old man's robes and beard scorching. There was no doubt that the fire was real, no matter that it left the ceiling intact.
The mage woke from his drugged trance, screaming in mindless pain and terror. The smell of his flesh and garments burning was spreading through the cellar, and reached even to where the man-woman lay huddled against the dank wall. He choked and gagged at the horrible reek, and the thing in the flames calmly bit the mage's head off, like a child with a gingerbread mannequin. It was too much for even the man-woman to endure. He rolled to one side and puked up the entire contents of his stomach. When he looked up again, eyes watering in the taste of bile in his mouth, the thing was staring at him, licking the blood off its hands. He swallowed as his gorge rose again, and waited for the thing to take him for dessert. You smell of magic. The thing's voice was like a dozen bells ringing, bells just slightly out of tune with one another. It made the man-woman nauseous and disoriented, but he swallowed again and tried to answer. I have a curse. So I see. I assume that was why I was summoned here. Well, unless we enter into an agreement, I have no choice but to remain here or return to the abyssal plains. Talk to me, puny one. I do not desire the latter. How? Why did you? The old man? I dislike being coerced, and your friend made the mistake of remaining within reach of the circle, but I have as yet no quarrel with you. I take it you wish to be rid of what you bear. Will you bargain to have your curse broken? What can you offer me? Gold? The demon laughed. Molten gold eyes slitted. I have more than that in mind. Sacrifice? Death? I can have those intangibles readily enough on my own, starting with yours. You are within my reach also. The man-woman thought frantically. The curse was cast by one you have reason to hate. This should make me love you. It should make us allies, at least. I could offer revenge. Now you interest me. The demon's eyes slitted. Come closer, little man. The man-woman clutched his rags about himself and ventured nearer step by cautious step. A quaint curse. Why? To make me a victim. It succeeded. It was not intended that I survive the experience. I can imagine. A cruel smile parted the demon's lips. A pretty thing you are. Didn't care for being raped, hmm? The man-woman's face flamed. He felt the demon inside of his mind, picking over all of his memories of the past year, lingering painfully over several he'd rather have died than seen revealed. Anger and shame almost replaced his fear. The demon's smile grew wider. Oh, did you begin to care for it after all? Get out of my mind, you bastard! He stifled whatever else he had been about to scream, wondering if he'd just written his own death glyph. I think I like you, little man. How can you give me revenge? He took a deep breath and tried to clear his mind. I know where they are, the sorceress and her partner. I know how to lure them here, and I have a plan to take them when they come. I have many such plans, but I did not know how to bring them within my grasp. Good. The demon nodded. I think perhaps we have a bargain. I shall give you the form you need to make you powerful against them, and I shall let you bring them here. Come 
and I will work the magic to change you, and free myself with the sealing of our bargain. I must touch you. The man-woman approached the very edge of the flames, cautious and apprehensive in spite of the demon's assurance that he would bargain. He still did not entirely trust this creature, and he more than certainly still feared its power. The demon reached out, with one long, molten bronze talon, and briefly caressed the side of his face. The stranger screamed in agony, for it felt as if that single touch had set every nerve afire. He wrapped his arms over his head and face, folded slowly at the waist and knees, still crying out, and finally collapsed to the floor, huddled in his rags, quivering. Had there been anything left in his stomach, he would have lost it then. The demon waited, as patient as a snake, drinking in the tingles of power and the heady aura of agony that the man was exuding. He bent over the shaking pile of rags in avid curiosity, waiting for the moment when the pain of transformation would pass. His expression was oddly human, the same expression to be seen on the face of a cruel child watching the gyrations of a beetle from which it has pulled all the legs but one. The huddled, trembling creature at the edge of his flames slowly regained control of itself. The quivering ceased. Rags rose a little, then moved again with more purpose. Long, delicate arms appeared from the huddle and pushed away from the floor. The rags fell away, and the rest of the stranger was revealed. The visitor raised one hand to her face, then froze at the sight of that hand. She pushed herself into a more upright position, frowning and shaking her head. She examined the other hand and felt of her face as her expression changed to one of total disbelief. Frantic now, she tore away the rags that shrouded her chest and stared in horror at two lovely, lily-white, and very female breasts. No, she whispered, it's not possible. Not for a human, perhaps, the demon replied with faint irony. But I am not subject to a human's limitations. What have you done to me? she shrieked, even her voice having changed to a thin soprano. I told you I would give you a form that would make you powerful against them. The sorceress's gesh prevents her from allowing any harm to befall a woman, so I merely made you woman in reality to match the woman you were in illusion. They will be powerless against you now, your enemies and mine. But I am not a woman. I can't be a woman. She looked around for something to throw at the demon's laughing face, and finding nothing, hurled curses instead. Make me a man again, damn you! Make me a man! Perhaps. Later, perhaps. When you have earned a boon from me. You still retain your strength and your weapon's expertise. Only the swordswoman could be any danger to you now, and the sorceress will be bound to see that she cannot touch you. My bargain now, bandit. The demon smiled still wider. Serve me, and it may well be I shall make you a man again, but your new body serves me far better than your old would have. And meanwhile, he drew a swirl of flame about himself. When he emerged from it, he had assumed the shape of a handsome human man, quite naked, one whose beauty repulsed even as it attracted. He was still larger than a normal human in every regard, but he no longer filled a quarter of the cellar. He stepped confidently across the boundaries of the circle, reached forward and gathered the frozen woman to him, she struggled wildly. He delighted in her struggles. Oh, you make a charming wench, little toy. You play the part as if you had been born to it. A man would have sought to slay me, but you 
think only to flee, and I do not think a man would have guessed my intentions, but you have, haven't you, little one? I think I can teach you some of the pleasures of being a female, as well as the fears, hmm? Perhaps I can make you forget you ever were anything else. His laughter echoed through the entire house, but the rest of the inhabitants did no more than check the fastenings of their doors and return to the safety of their beds, hoping that whatever it was that was laughing would overlook them. With another gesture, the demon transformed the bleak basement into a setting from a whore's nightmare. With his other hand, he held his victim crushed against his chest while he reached into her mind with his. She gasped in shock and dismay, feeling her will crumble before his, feeling him take over her senses and feeling those senses rousing as he wished them to. He ran his hands over her body, stripping away the rags until she was as nude as he, and in the wake of his hands her skin burned with fever she could not repress. As the last remains of her will fell to dust before his onslaught, her body, too, betrayed her, responding as the demon desired. And at the end, she did indeed forget for that one moment what it had been like to be a man. Kathry twined a lock of amber hair around her fingers, leaned over her cup, and hid a smile. She found the side of herself that her swordswoman partner was revealing disarming and quite delightful, but she doubted Tarma would appreciate her amusement. The common room of their inn was far from being crowded, and the atmosphere was relaxed and convivial. This was really the best such place they'd stayed in for months. It was well lit, the food was excellent, the beds comfortable and free of vermin, the prices not outrageously extortionate, and Tarma was certainly enjoying the company. As she had been every night for the past three, Tarma was embroiled in a religious discussion. A discussion, not an argument. Although the two participants often waxed passionate, neither ever found offense or became angered during their disagreements. Her fellow scholar was a plump little priest of Anathai of the Purifying Flame. He was certainly a full priest and might even, from his cultured accent, be a higher prelate, yet he wore only the same soft, dark brown, unornamented robes of the least of his order's acolytes. He was clean-shaven and quite bald, and his cheerful brown eyes seemed to regard everything and everyone with the open-hearted joy of an unspoiled child. No straight-laced ascetic he, he and Tarma had been trading rounds of good wine, tonight reds, last night whites. Tarma looked even more out of place seated across from him than she did with her sorceress partner. She towered over him by a head, her every movement proclaiming she knew very well how to manage that sword slung on her back, her hawk-like face and ice-blue eyes holding a controlled intensity that could easily have been frightening or intimidating to a stranger. With every article of her weaponry and earth-brown clothing so precisely arranged that what she wore might almost have been some kind of uniform, and her coarse black hair braided and coiled with militant neatness, she looked as much the priest or more than he, half-barbarian priest of some warlike order, that is. She hardly looked as if she could have anything in common with the scholarly little priest. She hardly looked literate. Certainly no one would expect erudite philosophy from her lips, not with the warlike accoutrements she bore. Yet she had been quoting fully as many learned tomes as the priest, to his evident delight and Kathry's mild surprise. It would appear that service as a sworn one did not exclude knowledge as a possible arena of combat. Kathry had long known that Tarma was literate, and in more than one language, but she had never before guessed that her partner was so erudite. Kathry herself was staying out of the conversation for the moment. This evening she and her partner had had an argument, the first serious disagreement of their association. She wanted to give Tarma a chance to cool down and to mull over what she'd said. 
because while it had been unpleasant, it was also, unfortunately, nothing less than the truth. You're not going out there alone, are you? Tarma had asked doubtfully, when Kethry had voiced her intention to prowl the rather dubious quarter that housed the gypsy mages. Kethry had heard that one of her old classmates had taken up with the wanderers and was looking for news of him. Why not? she asked, a little more sharply than she had intended. Because it's no place for a woman alone. Damn it, Tama, I'm not just any woman. I'm perfectly capable of taking care of myself. Look, even I can get taken out by a gang of street toughs. In the name of the gods, Tama, leave me alone for once. You're smothering me. I can't go anywhere or do anything without you rushing to wrap me in gauze like a piece of china. She'd stopped then, appalled by the stricken look on her partner's face. Then, like lightning, the expression changed. You're imagining things, Tarma replied flatly. All right, have it your way. Kethry was too tired to fight with her. You will anyway. Any time you hear something you don't like, you deny it and shut down on me, just like you're doing now. And she had turned on her heel and led the way into the inn's common room, ignoring the fact that Tarma looked as if the sorceress had just slapped her. The voice of the little priest penetrated her musing. Nay, he said, nay, I cannot agree. Our teaching is that evil is not a thing of itself. It is simply good that has not been brought to see the truth. We hold that even a demon can be redeemed, that even the most vile of such creatures could become a blessed spirit if someone with time and patience were to give him the proper redirection. Always supposing your proselytizer managed to keep from being devoured or ripped to shreds before he got a single word out, Tarma croaked wryly draping herself more comfortably over the edge of the worn wooden table. He'd better be either agile or one damned powerful mage. No, I can't agree with you, my friend. Aside from what Magister Tenevril has to say about them, I've dealt with a few demons up close and on a quite personal basis. I have to side with the Twin Sun School. The demonic beings must have been created purely of evil forces. It isn't just the abyssal dwellers that are bad clear through, either. I've known a few humans who could pass for demons. Evil is real, and a reality in and of itself. It likes being that way. It wouldn't choose to be anything else, and it has to be destroyed. Whenever a body gets the chance, or it'll spread, evil is easier to follow than good, and we humans like the easy path. I cannot agree. Those who are evil simply don't know what good is. Oh, they know all right, and they reject it to follow pure selfishness. I... The little priest blinked in the candlelight. Can you give me even one instance of great evil turned to good once good has been pointed out to it? Ah, he thought hard for a moment, then smiled triumphantly. The great demon wolf of Hastandel! Oh, that's too easy. Whirl! A shadow in the corner of the hearth uncoiled itself and proved to be no shadow at all but the Kyrie, whose shoulder came nearly as high as Tarma's waist. Closer inspection would reveal that Whirl's body was more like that of one of the great hunting cats of the plains than a lupine, built for climbing and short bursts of high speed, not the endurance of a true wolf. But the fur and head and tail were sufficiently wolf-like that this was how Tarma generally thought of him. He padded over to the table and benches shared by the ill-assorted trio. 
The conversation of all the other occupants of the inn died for a moment as he moved, but soon picked back up again. After three days, the patrons of the inn were growing a little more accustomed to the monster beast in their midst. Tarma had helped that along by coaxing him to demean himself with a few tricks to entertain them the first night of their stay. Now, while the sight of him still unsettled a few of them, they had come to regard him as harmless. They had no notion of his true nature. Tarma and Kethry had tactfully refrained from revealing that he was just as intelligent as any of them, and, quite probably, could beat any one of them at chess. Here's your demon wolf! One of his kin, rather. Tarma cocked her head to one side, her eyes far away as if she was listening. Kyrie is what they call themselves. They come from the Pelagir Hills. Worrell says to tell you that he knows that story, that Ura didn't know the sheep he'd been feeding on belonged to anyone. When he prowled the village at night, he was just being curious. Worrell says Ura had never seen humans before that lot moved in and settled. He thought they were just odd beasts and that the houses were some kind of dead growths. Believe me, I have seen some of what grows naturally in the Pelagiers. It isn't stretching the imagination to think that huts could grow of themselves once you've seen some of the bushes and trees. Well, Worrell wants you to know that when the priestess went out and gave Ura a royal tongue lashing for eating the stock, Ura was quite embarrassed. Without there being someone like me or Kethry, with the kind of mind that he could talk to, there wasn't much he could do by way of apology, but he did his best to make it up to the village. His people have a very high sense of honor. Sorry, little man, Ura is disqualified. He talks to you? The little priest said, momentarily diverted. That creature truly talks. I thought him just a well-trained beast. Oh, after all our conversation, I figured you to be open-minded enough to let in on the secret. Kyrie have a lot of talents. They're as bright as you or me. Brighter, maybe. I have no doubt he could give you a good battle at Tarok, and that's one game I have no gift for. As for talking, warriors, oh, sometimes I wish I could get him to stop. Oh, yes, he talks to me all right. Gives me no few pieces of unsolicited advice and criticism, and usually with an I told you so appended. She ruffled the great beast's fur affectionately, as he grinned a toothy, tongue-lolling grin. Kethry tossed him one of the bones left from their dinner. He caught it neatly on the fly and settled down beside her to enjoy it. Behind them, the hum of voices continued. Now I'll give you one, evil that served only itself. Dalkarsh, we had first-hand experience of that one. He had plenty of opportunity to see good. It wasn't just the trollops he had stolen for his rights. Or are you not familiar with that tale? Not the whole of it. Certainly not from one of the participants. Right enough, then. This is a long and thirsty story. Oscar! Tarma signaled the host, a plump, short-sighted man who hurried to answer her summons. Another round. Now make it a pitcher. This may take a while. Here. She tossed him a coin, as it was her turn to pay. The innkeeper trotted off and returned with a brimming earthen vessel. Kethry was amused to see that he did not return to his station behind the counter after placing it on the table between Tarma and the priest. Instead, he hovered just within earshot, polishing the tables next to them with studious care. While she didn't blame him, this was a tale Tarma didn't tell often, and it wasn't likely anyone in Oberdorn had ever heard a first-hand account of it. Oscar, would be attracting folk to his tables for months after they'd gone with repetitions of the story. From all we could put together afterward, Thalkarsh was a demon that had been summoned purely by mistake. It was a mistake the mage who called him paid for. Well, that's usually the case when something like that happens. This time, though, things were evidently a little different. She nodded at Kethry who took up the thread of the story while Tarma took a sip of wine. Thalkash had ambition. He didn't want to live in his own abyssal plains anymore. He wanted to escape them. 
More than that, he wanted far more power than he had already. He wanted to become a god, or a godling at least. He knew that the quickest ways of gaining power are by worship, pain, and death. The second two he already had a taste of, and he craved more. The first, well, he calculated that he knew ways of gaining that too. He transformed himself into a very potently sexual and pleasing shape, built himself a temple with a human pawn as his high priest, and set up a religion. It was a religion tailored to his peculiar tastes. From what I know, most of the demonic types wouldn't think of copulating with a human any more than you or I would with a dog. Dalkarsh thought otherwise. Tarma grimaced. Of course, a part of that is simply because of the amount of pain he could cause while engaging in his recreations. But it may be he also discovered that sex is another very potent way of raising power. Whatever the reason, that was what the whole religion was founded on. The rituals always culminated with Thalkarsh taking a half-dozen women, torturing and killing them when he'd done with them, in the full view of his worshippers. There's a kind of mind that finds that stimulating. Before too long, he had a full congregation and was well on his way to achieving his purpose. That was where we came in. You know our reputation for helping women, Kethry put in. You have a gesh? ventured the little priest. Something like that. Well, since Thalkash's chosen victims were almost exclusively female, we found ourselves involved. We slipped into the temple in disguise and went for the high priest, figuring if he was the one in charge, that might solve the problem. We didn't know he was a puppet, though I had guessed he might be, and then dismissed the idea. Kethry sighed. Then we found our troubles had only begun. He had used this as a kind of impromptu test of the mettle of his servant. When the servant failed, he offered me the position. I was tempted with anything I might want, nearly unlimited power, beauty, wealth, and him. He was incredibly seductive. I can't begin to tell you how much. To try and give you a notion of his power, every one of his victims ran to him willingly when he called her, even though they knew what their fate would be. Well, I guess I resisted him a little too long. He became impatient with me and knocked me into a wall, unconscious, or so he thought. Then he made me the same offer, Tarma continued. Only with me he demonstrated his power, rather than just promising things. He totally transformed me. When he was done, kings would have paid money for the privilege of laying their crowns at my feet. He also came damned close to breaking my bond with the star-eyed. I swear to you, I was within inches of letting him seduce me, except that the more he roused my body, the more he roused my anger. That was his mistake. I pretended to give in when I saw Kethry sneaking up behind him. Then I broke his focus just as she stabbed him. He lost control over his form and his worshippers' minds. When they saw what he really was, they deserted him. That broke his power, and it was all over. Shianadra, you were in no danger of breaking. Your will is too strong. He'd have needed either more time to work on you or power to equal the warriors. Maybe. It was a damn near thing, too near for my liking. Well, he was absolute evil for the sake of it, and I should well know. I had that evil crawling around in my mind. Besides that, there were other things that came out afterward. We know he took a few innocent girls who just had the bad luck to be in the wrong place. We think some clerics went in to try and exorcise him. It's hard to say for certain since they were hedge priests, wanderers with no set temple, we do know they disappeared between one night and the next, that they did not leave town by the gates, and that they had been talking about dealing with Thalkarsh before they vanished. She trailed off, the set of her mouth grim, her eyes bleak. We can only assume they went the way of all of his victims, since they were never seen or heard from again. 
So Thalkarsh had plenty of opportunity to see good and the light, and he apparently saw it only as another thing to crush. The little priest said nothing. There seemed nothing appropriate to say. Instead, he took a sip of his wine. From the distant look in his eyes, he was evidently thinking hard. We of Anathai are not fools, sworn one, he said finally. Even though we may not deal with evil as if it were our deadly enemy, no. To throw one's life away in the foolish and prideful notion that one's own sanctity is enough to protect one from everything is something very like a sin. The arrow that strikes a friend in battle instead of a foe is no less deadly because it is misdirected. Let me tell you this. When dealing with the greater evils, we do nothing blindly. We study carefully. We take no chances. We know everything there is to be known about an opponent before we face him to show him the light, and we take very great care that he is unable to do us harm in his misguided state. Tarma's eyes glinted with amusement in the shifting light. Then it may well be your folk have the right of it. And in any case, you're going about your conversions in a practical manner, which is more than I can say for many. Once again, we will have to agree to disagree. With that, lady, I rest content. He bowed to her a little, and the bench creaked under his moving weight. But we still have not settled the point of contention, even if I were willing to concede that you are right about Dalkash, which I am not. He was still a demon, not a man, and, well, if you want... Irredeemable evil in a human. We can give you that, too. Kethry, remember that bastard Lastel Longknife? Lady Bright, now there was an unredeemable soul, if ever there was one. Kethry saw out of the corner of her eye that Oscar had not moved since the tale-telling had begun, and was in a fair way to polish a hole right through the table. She wondered, as she smothered a smile, if that was the secret behind the scrupulously clean furniture of his inn. Lastel Longknife, the priest said curiously. I doubt you'd have heard of that one. He was a bandit that had set up a band out in the waste between here and— Wait, I think I do know that story, the priest exclaimed. Isn't there a song about it, one that goes deep into the stony hills miles from keep or hold? Ladies, Blade, is that nonsense going to follow us everywhere? Tarma grimaced in distaste, while Kethry gave up on trying to control her giggles. Damned impudent rhymester! I should never have agreed to talk to him, never, and if I ever get my hands on Leslak again, I'll kill him twice. Bad enough he got the tail all backward, but that manure about three things never anger or you will not live for long, a wolf with cubs, a man with power, and a woman's sense of wrong, came damn close to ruining business for a while. We weren't gesh pressed that time, or being altruistic. We were in it for the money, damn it. And, she turned to scowl at Kethry, what are you laughing about? Nothing. One look at Tarma's face set her off again. No respect. I don't get it from stupid minstrels. I don't get it from my partner. I don't even get it from you, furface. Worrell put his head down on his paws and contrived to look innocent. Well, if my partner can contrive to control herself, this is what really happened. Longknife had managed to unite all the little bandit groups into one single band with the promise that they would be able, under his leadership, to take even the most heavily guarded pack trains. He made good on his boast. Before a few months passed, it wasn't possible for a mouse to travel the trade road unmolested. But surely they sent out decoy trains? Oh, they did. Longknife had an extra factor in his favor. Kethry had managed to get herself back into control again and answered him. He had a talent for mind magic, like they practice in Valdemar. It wasn't terribly strong, but it was very specific. 
Anyone who saw Long Knife thought that he was someone they had known for a long time, but not someone anywhere within riding distance. That way, he avoided the pitfall of having his double show up. He looked to be a different person to everyone, but he always looked like someone they trusted. So he managed to get himself included as a guard on each and every genuine pack train going out. When the time was right, he'd signal his men and they'd ambush the train. If it was too well guarded, he'd wait until it was his turn on night watch and drive away the horses and pack beasts. There's no water in the waste, and the guards and traders would have to abandon their goods and make for home afoot. That's almost diabolically clever. You do well to use that word. He was diabolic, all right. One of the first trains he and his men took was also conveying a half dozen or so young girls to Fosterage, daughters of the traders in town. The idea being that they were more likely to find young men to their liking in a bigger city. Longknife and his men could have ransomed them unharmed, could even have sold them. He didn't. He took his pleasure of each of them in turn until he tired of them then turned them over to his men to be gang-raped to death without a second thought. The priest thought that if the minstrel Leslak could have seen the expression in Tarma's eyes at this moment, he'd have used stronger words in his song than he had. The uncle of one of the girls found out we were in a town nearby and sent for us. Cathery picked up when Tarma seemed lost in her own grim thoughts. We agreed to take the job and disguised ourselves to go out with the next train. That's where the song is worst wrong. I was the lady. Tama was the maidservant. When the bandits attacked, I broke the illusions. Surprise gave us enough of an advantage that we managed to rout them. We didn't kill them all. Really didn't even get most of them, just the important ones, the leaders. Tama came back to herself and resumed the tale. And we got Long Knife, the key to the whole business. What? What was the thorough vengeance? The priest asked. I have been eaten up with curiosity ever since I heard the song, but I hardly know if I dare ask. Tarma's harsh laugh rang as she tossed back her head. We managed to keep one thing from that songster anyway. All right, I'll let you in on the secret. Cathery put an all-senses illusion on him and bound it to his own mind magic so that he couldn't be rid of it. She made him look like a very attractive, helpless woman. We made sure he was unconscious. Then we tied him to his horse and sent him into the waste following the track of what was left of his band. I've no doubt... He knew exactly what his victims had felt like before he finally died. Remind me never to anger you, sworn one. The priest shook his head ruefully. I'm not sure I care for your idea of justice. Turnabout is fair play, and it's no worse than what he'd have gotten at the hands of the relatives of the girls he murdered, Cathery pointed out. Thomas Lady does not teach that evildoers should remain unpunished, nor does mine, and Longknife is another bit of scum who had ample opportunity to do good, or at least no harm, and chose instead to deliberately inflict the most harm he could. I think he got his just desserts, personally. If you, too, are going to enter the affray, I fear I am outnumbered. The priest smiled. But I shall retire with dignity allowing the justice of your assertions, but not conceding you the victory, though it is rather strange that you should mention the demon Thalkash just now. Both Tarma and Kethry came instantly alert. They changed their positions not so much as a hair, Tarma leaning on both arms that rested on the table, Kethry lounging a little against the wall. But now they both had dropped the veneer of careless ease they had worn and beneath that thin skin the wary vigilance of the predator and hunter showed plain. Why? Tarma asked carefully. Because 
I have heard rumors in the beggar's quarter that some ill-directed soul is trying to re-establish the worship of Thalkash in the old temple of Duros there. More than that, we have had reports of the same from a young woman who apparently dwells there. Have you? Kethry pushed back the hood of her buff-colored robe. Worshipping Thalkash. That's a bit injudicious, considering what happened at Delton, isn't it? Injudicious, to say the least, the priest replied, since they must know what will happen to them if they are discovered. The prince is not minded to have light women slaughtered on altars instead of paying his venery taxes. I heard that after Thalkash's depredations, his income from Delton was halved for the better part of three years. He took care to alter or tighten the laws concerning religious practice after that. Human sacrifice in any form is punishable by enslavement. If the perpetrator has murdered taxpayers, he goes to the prince's mages for their experiments. Catherine lifted an eyebrow. Tarma took a largish mouthful of wine. They'd both heard about how Prince Lothar's mages produced his monstrous, mindless bodyguards. They'd also heard that the process from normal man to twelve-foot-tall brute was far from pleasant, or painless. Lothar was sometimes called the loony, but never to his face. The little priest met blue and green eyes in turn and nodded. Besides that, he continued, there are several sects, mine included, who would wish to deal with the demon on other levels. We all want him bound at the least, but so far it's all rumor. The temple has been empty every time anyone's checked. So you did check? In all conscience, yes, although the woman didn't seem terribly trustworthy or terribly bright. Pretty, yes, Rather remarkably pretty under the dirt, but she seemed to be in a half daze all the time. Brother Thoza was the one who questioned her, not I, or I could tell you more. My guess would be that she was of breeding, but had taken to the street to supply an addiction of some sort. Tarma nodded thoughtfully. Where is this temple? Kathri's husky alto almost made the little priest regret his vow of chastity. And when she had moved into the light, and he saw that the sweet face beneath the hood matched the voice, he sighed a little for days long lost. Do you know the beggar's quarter? Well, then it's on the river, just downwind of the slaughterhouse and the tannery. It's been deserted since the last acolyte died of old age. Oh, nearly fifteen years ago. It's beginning to fall apart a bit. The last time I looked at it, there didn't seem to be any signs that anyone had entered it in all that time. Is it kept locked up? Oh, yes. Not that there's anything to steal. Mostly it's to keep children from playing where they might be hurt by falling masonry. The beggars used it for a bit as one of their meeting halls before the acolyte died, but, <laughs> he chuckled, one-eyed Tham told me it was too perishing cold and damp, and they moved to more comfortable surroundings. Tarma exchanged a look with her partner. We need to talk, she hand-signed. Kathry nodded ever so slightly. We could be in trouble, she signed back. Tarma's grimace evidenced agreement. Well, if you will allow me. The little priest finished the last of his wine and shoved the bench back with a scrape. I fear I have morning devotions to attend to. As always, sworn one, the conversation and company have been delightful, if argumentative. Tarma managed a smile. It transformed her face, even if it didn't quite reach her eyes. My friend, we have a saying. It translates something like, There is room in the universe for every way. You travel yours. Should you need it, my sword will protect you as I travel mine. That is all anyone could reasonably ask of one who does not share his faith, he replied. And so, good night. The two mercenary women finished their own wine and headed for their room shortly after his departure, with Worrell padding after. 
Kathry took one of the candles from the little table standing by the entrance to the hall, lit it at the lantern above the table, and led the way down the corridor. The wooden walls were polished enough that their light was reflected. They'd been tended to recently, and Tarma could still smell the ferrous oil that had been used. The sounds of snoring behind closed doors, the home-like scents of hot wax and ferrous oil, the buzz of conversation from the inn behind them, all contrasted vividly with the horror that had been resurrected in both their minds at the mention of Thalkarsh. Their room held two narrow beds, a rag rug and a table, all worn but scrupulously clean. They had specified a room with a window, so Worrell could come and go as he pleased. No one in his right mind would break into the room with any of the three of them in it, and their valuables were in the stable, well guarded by their well-named war steeds, Hellsbane and Ironheart. When the door was closed and bolted behind them, Kethry put the candle in its wall sconce and turned to face her partner with a swish of robes. If he's there, if it's really Thalkash, he'll be after us. Tarma paced the narrow confines of the room. Seems obvious. If I were a demon, I'd want revenge. Well, we knew this might happen someday. I take it that your sword hasn't given you any indication that there's anything wrong. No, at least nothing more than what you'd expect in a city this size. I wish Need would be a little more discriminating. Kethry sighed, and one hand caressed the hilt of the blade she wore at her side over her sorceress's robes in an unconscious gesture of habit. I absolutely refuse to go sticking my nose into every lover's quarrel in this town, and— Warrior's oath! Remember the first time you tried? Tarma's grim face lightened into a grin with the recollection. Oh, laugh, go ahead. You were no help. Here you thought the shrew was in danger of her life. You went flying in the door and knocked her man out cold. And you expected her to throw herself at your feet in gratitude. Tarma was taking full revenge for Kathry's earlier hilarity at her expense. And what did she do? Began hurling crockery at you, shrieking you'd killed her beloved. Lady's eyes, I thought I was going to die. I wanted to take her over my knee and beat her with the flat of my blade. And to add insult to injury, need wouldn't let you lay so much as a finger on her. I had to go in with a serving dish for a shield and rescue you before she tore you to shreds. She could have done that with her tongue alone, Kathry grimaced. Well, that's not solving our problem here. True, Tarma conceded, sobering. She threw herself down on her bed, Worrell jumping up next to her and pushing his head under her hand. Back to the subject. Let's assume that the rumor is true. We can't afford not to. If somebody has brought that particular demon back, we know he's going to want our hides. Or worse. Or worse. Now, he can't have gotten too powerful, or everybody in town would know about him. Remember Delton? Kathry shifted restlessly from foot to foot, finally going over to the window to open the shutters with a creak of hinges and stare out into the night. I remember... And I remember that we'd better do something about him while he's in that state. This isn't a job for us, Shianidra. It's a job for priests. Powerful priests. I remember what he almost did to me. He came perilously close to breaking my bond with the star-eyed, and he boasted he could snap your tie to need just as easily. I think we ought to ride up to the capital as fast as Hellsbane and Ironheart can carry us and fetch us some priests. And come back to an empty town and a demon transformed to a godling? Kethry turned away from the window to shake her head at her partner, her amber hair like a sunset cloud around her face and a shadow of anger in her eyes. What if we're wrong? We'll have some very powerful people very angry at us for wasting their time. And... If we're right, we have to act fast. We have to take him while he's still weak, or we'll never send him back to the Abyssal Plains at all. He is no stupid imp. He's learned from what we did to him. You can bet on it. If he's not taken down now, we'll never be able to take him at all. 
That's not our job. Whose is it then? Kathry dug her fingers into the wood of the window frame behind her, as tense and worried as she'd ever been. We'd better make it our job if we're going to survive. And I told you earlier, I don't want you cosseting me. I know what I'm doing, and I can protect myself. Tarma sighed, and there was a shadow of guilt on her face as she rolled over to lie flat on her back, staring at the ceiling, her hands clasped under her head, one leg crossed over the other. All right, then. I don't know a damn thing about magic, and all I care to know about demons outside of a book is that they scare me witless. I still would rather go for help, but if you don't think we'd have the time, and if you are sure you're not getting into more than you can handle, I know we wouldn't have the time. He's not going to waste time building up a power base, Kethry replied sitting down on the edge of Tarma's bed, making the frame creak. And he may not be there at all. It might just be a wild rumor. It might. I don't think I'd care to bet my life on waiting to see, though. So we need information. Reliable information. The question is, how to get it? Should I try scrying? Absolutely not! Tarma flipped back over onto her side her hand chopping at the pillow for emphasis. Worrell winced away and looked at her reproachfully. He caught that poor witch back in Delton that way, remember? That much even I know. If you scry, he'll have you on his ground. I promise I won't cuss at you any more, but I will not allow you to put yourself in jeopardy when there are any other alternatives. Well, how then? Me. Karma stabbed at her own chest with an emphatic thumb. Granted, I'm not a thief, but I am a skilled scout. I can slip into and out of that temple without anyone knowing. I've been there, and if it's being used for anything, I'll be able to tell. No. Yes, no choice, Shianadra. All right, then, but you won't be going without me. If he and any followers he may have gathered are there, and they're using magic to mask their presence, you won't see anything, but I can invoke mage sight and see through any illusions. Tarma began to protest, but this time Kethry cut her short. You haven't a choice either. You need my skill, and I won't let you go in there without me. Damn it, Tarma, I am your partner, your full partner. If I have to, I'll follow you on my own. You would, wouldn't you? You can bet on it. Kathry scowled, then smiled as Tarma's resigned expression told her she'd won the argument. Worrell nudged Tarma's hand again, and she began scratching absentmindedly behind his ears. A scowl creased her forehead, but her mouth, too, was quirked in an almost smile. Warrior's oath. I would tie myself to a headstrong, stubborn, foolish, reckless, crazed mage who loves her bond sister and won't allow her to throw her life away, who is dearer to me than my own life. Kethry reached out at almost the same moment as Tarma did. They touched hands briefly, crescent-scarred palm to crescent-scarred palm, and exchanged rueful smiles. Argument over. It's over. All right, then, Tarma said after poignant silence. Let's get to it now, while we've still got the guts for it. Chapter 10 Tarma led the way, as soft and sure-footed in these dark city streets as she would have been scouting a forest or creeping through grass on an open plain. The Kyrie whirl served as their scout and their eyes in the darkness. The uninformed would have thought it impossible to hide a lupine creature the size of Worrell in an open street, a creature whose shoulder nearly came as high as Tarma's waist, but Worrell, although somewhere close at hand, was presently invisible. Tarma could sense him, though, now behind them, now in front. From time to time he would speak a single word, or perhaps as many as three in her mind, to tell her of the results of his scouting. There was little moonlight. The moon was in her last quarter. 
This was one of the poorest streets in the city, and there were no cressets and no torches to spare to light the way by night. And if anyone put one up, it would be stolen within the hour. The buildings to either side were shut up tight, not with shutters, for they were in far too poor a state of repair to have working shutters, but with whatever bits of wood and cloth or rubbish came to hand. What little light there was leaked through the cracks in these makeshift curtainings. The street itself was rutted mud. No wasting of paving bricks on this side of the river. Both the mercenaries wore thin-soled boots, the better to feel their way in the darkness. Kethry had abandoned her usual buff-colored calf-length robe. She wore a dark, sleeved tunic over her breeches. Kethry's ensorcelled blade need was slung at her side. Tarma's non-magical weapon carried in its usual spot on her back. They had left cloaks behind. Cloaks had a tendency to get tangled at the most inopportune moments. Better to bear with the chill. They had slipped out the window of their room at the inn, wanting no one to guess where they were going, or even that they were going out at all. They had made their way down back alleys with occasional detours through fenced yards or even across roofs. Although Kethry was no match for Tarma in strength and agility, she was quite capable of keeping up with her on a trek like this one. Finally, the fences had begun to boast more holes than entire boards. The houses leaned to one side or the other, almost as though they huddled together to support their sagging bones. The streets, when they had ventured out onto them, were either deserted or populated by one or two furtively scurrying shadows. This dubious quarter, where the abandoned temple that their priestly friend had told them of stood, this was hardly a place either of them would have chosen to roam in daylight, much less darkness. Tarma was already beginning to regret the impulse that had led her here, the stubbornness that had forced her to prove that she was not trying to shelter her partner unduly. Except that maybe Kethry was right. Maybe she was putting a stranglehold on the mage, but Keth was all the clan she had. Tarma's nose told her where they were, downwind of the stockyards, the slaughterhouse, and the tannery. The reek of tannic, acid, awful, half-tanned hides and manure was a little short of unbreathable. From far off, there came the intermittent lowing and bleating of the miserable animals awaiting the doom that would come in the morning. Something just occurred to me, Kethry whispered as they waited, hidden in shadows, for a single passerby to clear the street. What? This close to the stockyard and slaughterhouse, Thalkash wouldn't necessarily need sacrifices to build a power base. You mean... He could use the deaths of the beasts. Death energy is the same for man and beast. Man just has more of it and of higher quality. Like, you can get just as drunk on cheap beer as on distilled spirits. Something of the sort. Ladies blade. And he feeds on fear and pain as well. There's plenty of that at the slaughterhouse. Great, that's just what I needed to hear. Tarma brooded for a moment. Tell me something. Why is he taking on human shape if he wants to terrify? His own would be better for that purpose. Well, this is just a guess. You have to remember, he wants worship and devotion as well, and he won't get that in his real shape. That might be one reason. A second would be because what seems to be familiar and proves to be otherwise is a lot more fear-inducing than the openly alien. Lastly is Thalkash himself. Most demons like the abyssal plains, and their anger at being summoned is because they've been taken from home. They look on us as a lower form of life, a species of animal. But Thalkash is perverse, he wants to stay here. He wants to rule over people, and I suspect he enjoys physically coupling with humans. The lady only knows why. I don't suppose he can breed, can he? When born, 
Thank your lady, no. Thank all the gods that demons, even in human form, are sterile with humans, or we might have more than Thalkash to worry about. He might be willing to produce a malleable infant, but the only way he can reproduce is to bud, and he's too jealous of his powers here to bud and create another on this plane with like powers and a mind of its own. He won't go creating a rival that much I'm sure of. Forgive me if I don't break into carols of relief. They peered down the dark, shadow-lined street in glum silence. The effluvium of the stockyards and tannery washed over them, causing Tarma to stifle a cough as an acrid breath seared the back of her throat a little. The street is clear, a voice rang in Tarma's head. Warl says it's safe to go. Tarma passed the word on. Then, crouching low, crossed the street like one of the scudding shadows cast on the street by high clouds against the moon. She moved so surely and so silently from the shadows of their own building to the shadows below the one across the street that even Kethry, who knew she was there, hardly saw her. Kethry was an instant behind her, not quite so sure or silent, but furtive enough. Worrell was already waiting for them, and snorted a greeting before slipping farther ahead of them in the direction of the temple. Hugging the rough wood and stone of the walls, they inched their way down the street, trying not to wince when their feet encountered unidentifiable piles of something soft and mushy. The reek of tannery and stockyard overwhelmed any other taint. From within the buildings occasionally came sounds of revelry or conflict. Horse, drunken singing, shouting, weeping, the splintering of wood, the crash of crockery. None of this was carried into the streets. Only fools and the mad walked the streets of the beggar's quarter at night. Fools, the mad, or the desperate. Right now, Kethry had both of them figured for being all three. Finally, the walls of buildings gave way to a single stone wall, half again as tall as Tarma. This, by the descriptions she'd gotten, would be the wall of the temple. Beyond it, bulking black against the stars, Kethry could see the temple itself. Tarma surveyed the wall, deciding it would be no great feat to scale it. You go over first, Furface, she thought. My pleasure, Worrell sent back to her. Overtones of irony so strong Tarma could almost taste the metallic emotional flavoring. He backed up six or seven paces, then flung himself at the wall. His forepaws caught the top of it, caught and held, and with a scrambling of hind claws that sounded hideously loud to Tarma's nervous ears, he was over and leaping down on the other side. Now it was her turn. She backed up a little then ran at the wall, leaping and catching the top effortlessly, pulling herself up onto the stones that were set into the top with ease. She crouched there for a moment, peering through the darkness into the courtyard beyond, identifying the odd-shaped shadows by what she'd been told to expect there. In the middle, there stood a dried-out fountain, its basin broken, its statuary mostly missing limbs and heads. To the right, were three stone boxes containing earth and dead trees. To the left had been a shrine, now a heap of rubble, that had been meant for the faithful who felt unworthy to enter the temple proper. All was as it should be. Nothing moved. I'd tell you if anything was here, wouldn't I? Worrell grumbled at her lack of trust. She felt one corner of her mouth twitch at his reply. I can take it that... All's well. Nothing out of the ordinary outside. It's inside I'm worried about. She saluted Kethry briefly, seeing the strained, anxious face peering whitely up at her in the moon shadows, then slipped over the top to land on cat-quiet feet in the temple courtyard. She slid carefully along the wall, left foot testing the ground at the base of it for loose pebbles that might slip underfoot or be kicked away by accident. The moon was behind her, so her side of the wall was entirely in shadow so long as she stayed close to it. Five steps. 
twenty, fifty, her outstretched hand encountered a hinge, and wood. She'd come to the gate. She felt for the bar and eased it along its sockets until one half of the gate was freed. That gave Kethry her way in. Now she would scout ahead. She waited for another of those scudding cloud shadows, joining it as it raced across the courtyard. Cobblestones were hard and a trifle slippery beneath her thin-soled boots. She was glad that the first sole was of tough, abrasive sharkskin. Dew was already beginning to collect on the cold stones, making them slick, but the sharkskin leather gave her traction. She reached the shelter of the temple entrance without incident. Worrell was waiting for her there, a slightly darker shadow in the shadows of the doorway. Ready? she asked him. She felt his assent. She reached for the door, prepared to find it locked, and was pleasantly surprised when it wasn't. She nudged it open a crack. When nothing happened, she opened it enough to peer carefully inside. She saw nothing but a barren antechamber. Worrell stuck his nose inside and sniffed cautiously. Nothing here, but something on the other side of the door beyond, people for sure, and, I think, blood and incense. And magic. Lots of magic. Tarma sighed. It would have been nice if this had been a false alarm. Sounds like we've come to the right place. Shouldn't we wait for Kethry? You go after her. I want to make sure there isn't anyone on guard in there. Not yet. I want to know you aren't biting off more than you can swallow. Worrell waited for her to move on, one shadow among many. She slipped in through the crack in the door, Worrell a hair's breadth behind her. Moonlight shone down through a skylight above. The door on the other side of the antechamber stood open. Between it and the door she had entered, there was nothing but untracked dust. She hugged the wall easing carefully around the doorpost. Once inside the sanctuary, she could barely see her own hands. She continued to hug the wall, making her way by feel alone. She came to a corner, paused for a moment and tried to see, but could only make out dim shapes in the small amount of light that came from various holes in the ceiling of the sanctuary. It was impossible to tell if those sources of light were more skylights or the evidence of neglect. Dust filled the air, making her nose itch. Other than that, lacking Worrell's senses, she could only smell damp and mildew. The stones beneath her hands were cold and slightly moist. Beneath the film of moisture they were smooth and felt a little like polished granite. She went on, coming at last around behind the statue of the rain god that stood at the far end of the room. The shadows were even deeper here. She slowed her pace to inch along the stuccoed wall, one hand feeling before her. Then, her hand encountered emptiness. A door. I can tell that. A door to where? To where the blood smell is. Then we take it. I'm going on ahead. You go back and fetch Catherine. Now she was alone in pitchy darkness with only the rough brick wall of the corridor as a guide, and the faint sound of her footsteps bouncing off the walls to tell her that it was a corridor. She held back impatience and continued to feel her way with extreme caution, until once again her hand encountered open air. She was suddenly awash with light, frozen by it, surrounded by it on all sides, she would have been prepared for any attack but this, which left her blind and helpless, with tears of pain blurring what little vision she had. She went automatically into a defensive crouch, pulling her blade over her head with both hands from the sheath on her back, only to hear a laugh like a dozen brass bells from some point above her head. Little warrior! <laughs> the voice said caressingly. I have so longed for the day when we might meet again. <laughs> I can't say I feel the same about you, Tarma replied after a bit, trying to locate the demon by sound alone. I suppose it's too much to expect you to stand and fight me honorably. She could see nothing but angry red light, like flame, but without the heat. 
Perhaps the light was a little brighter above and just in front of her. She tried to will her eyes to work, but they remained dazzled, with lances of pain shooting into her skull every time she blinked. There was a smell of blood and sex and something more that she couldn't quite identify. Her heart was racing wildly with fear, but she was determined not to let him see how helpless she felt. Honor is for fools, and I may have been a fool in the past, but I am no longer quite so gullible. No, little warrior, I shall not stand and fight you. I shall not fight you at all. I shall simply put you to sleep. A sickly sweet aroma began to weave around her, and Tarma recognized it after a moment as black tran dust, the most powerful narcotic she knew of. She had only that moment of recognition before she felt her control over herself suddenly melt away. Her entire body went numb in a single breath, and she fell, face down on the floor, mind and body alike paralyzed, sword falling from a hand that could no longer hold it. And now that you cannot fight me, said a silky voice in her mind, I shall make of you what I will, and somewhat more to my taste than the ice creature you are now, and this time your goddess shall not be able to help you. I am nearly a god now myself, and the gods are forbidden to war upon other gods. <laughs> the last thing she heard was his laughter, like bronze bells slightly out of tune with one another. Kathry fretted inwardly, counting down the moments until she was supposed to try the gate. This was the hardest part for certain, the waiting. Anything else she could manage with equanimity. Waiting brought out the worst fears, roused her imagination to a fever pitch. The plan was for Tarma and Worrell to check the courtyard, then unlock the gates for her. They would precede her into the temple as well. They were to meet in the sanctuary, after Tarma had declared it free of physical hazards. It was a plan Kathry found herself misliking more with every passing moment. They were a team. It went against the grain to work separately. Granted, Worrell was with Tarma. Granted that she was something of a handicap in a skulk and hide situation like this. Still, Kathry couldn't help thinking that she'd be able to detect dangers neither of the other two would notice. More than that, her place was with Tarma, not waiting in the wings. Now she began to wish she hadn't told the Shinain that she intended to investigate this place. If she'd kept her mouth shut, she could have done this properly, by daylight, perhaps. Finally, her impatience became too much. She felt her way along the wall to the wooden gates and pushed very slightly on one of them. It moved. Tarma had succeeded in this much, anyway. The gates were now unbarred. She pushed a little harder. Slowly, carefully, the gate swung open just enough for her to squeeze herself through, scraping herself on the wooden bulwarks both fore and aft as she did so. Before her lay the courtyard, mostly open ground. Remembering all Tarma had taught her, she crouched as low as she could, waited until the moon passed behind a cloud, and sprinted for the shelter of the dried-up fountain. Under the rim, in shadows, she looked around, watching not for objects, but for movement, any movement. But there was no movement, anomalous or otherwise. She crawled under the rim until she lay hidden on the side facing the temple doors. She watched, but saw nothing. She listened, but heard only crickets and toads. She waited, aching from the strain of holding herself still in such an awkward position until the moon again went behind a cloud. She sprinted for the temple doors, flinging herself against the wall of the temple behind a pillar as soon as she reached them. It was then that she realized that there had been something very anomalous at the gate. The aged gates, allegedly locked for fifteen years, had opened smoothly and without a sound, 
as if they had been oiled and put into working order within the past several days. Something was very wrong. A shadow bulked in front of her, and she started with alarm. She pulled the sword in a defensive move before she realized that her enemy was Worrell. He reached for her arm and his teeth closed gently on her tunic. He tugged at her sleeve. That meant Tarma wanted her. You didn't meet with anything, Kethry whispered. Worrell snorted. I think that they are all asleep or blind. A cub could have penetrated this place. This was too easy. All her instincts were in an uproar, too easy by far. She suddenly realized what their easy access to this place meant. This was a trap. And now Kethry felt a shrill alarm course through her every nerve, a double alarm. Need was alerting her to a woman in the deadliest danger and very nearby, and the bond of Shianadrin was resonating with soul-deep threat to her blood sister. Tarma was in trouble. As if to confirm her fears, Worrell threw up his head and voiced his battle cry and charged within, leaving Kethry behind. And given the urgency of Need's pull, that could only mean one thing. Thalkarsh was here, and he had the sworn one at his non-existent mercy. The time for subterfuge was over. Kethry pulled her ensorcelled blade with her left hand and caused a blue-green witch light to dance before her with a gesture from her right, then kicked open the doors of the temple and flung herself frantically through them. She landed hard against the dingy, white-plastered wall of a tiny cobwebbed anteroom, bruising her shoulder, and found herself staring foolishly at an empty chamber. Another door stood in the opposite wall, slightly ajar. She inched along the wall and eased it open with the tip of her blade. The witch light showed nothing beyond it but a brick-walled tunnel that led deeper into the temple proper. Worrell must already have run down this way. She moved stealthily through the door and into the corridor, praying to find Tarma and soon. The internal alerts of both her blade and her blood bond were nigh unbearable, and she hardly dared contemplate what that meant to Tarma's well-being. But the corridor twisted and turned like a cadessa run, seemingly without end. With every new corner she expected to find something, but every time she rounded a corner she saw only another long, dust-choked extension of the corridor behind her. The dust showed no tracks at all, not even whorls. Could she have somehow come the wrong way? But there were only two directions to choose, forward or back the way she had come. Back she would never go, that left only forward, and forward was yard after yard of blank-walled corridor, with never a door or a break of any kind. She slunk on and on in a kind of nightmarish entrancement in which she lost all track of time. There was only the endlessly turning corridor before her and the cry for help within her. Nothing else seemed of any import at all. As the urgings of her geshblade need and the bond that tied her to Tarma grew more and more frantic, she was close to being driven nearly mad with fear and frustration. She was being distracted. So successfully, in fact, that it wasn't until she'd wasted far too much precious time trying to thread the maze that she realized what it must be. A magical construct, meant to delay her, augmented by spells of befuddlement. You bastard! she screamed at the invisible Thalkash, enraged by his duplicity. He had made a serious mistake in doing something that caused her to become angry. That rage was useful. It fueled her power. She gathered it to her, made a force of it instead of allowing it to fade uselessly, sought and found the weak point of the spell. She sheathed need, and, spreading her arms wide over her head, palms facing each other, blasted, with the white heat of her anger. Mage energies formed a glowing blue-white arc between her upraised hands. A sorcerer's wind began to stir around her, forming a miniature whirlwind with herself as the eye. With a flick of her wrists, she reversed her hands to hold them palm outward and brought her arms down fully extended to shoulder height. The mage light poured from them to form a wall around her. Then the wall expanded outward. The brick corridor walls about her flared with scarlet as the glowing wall of energy touched them. They shivered beneath the wrath-fired mage blast, wavered and warped 
like the mirages they were. There was a moment of resistance, then, soundlessly, they vanished. She saw she was standing in what had been the outer, common sanctuary, an enormous room, supported by two rows of pillars whose tops were lost in the shadows of the ceiling. Tracks in the dust showed she had been tracing the same circling path all the time she had thought she was traversing the corridor. Her anger brightened the witchlight. The green-blue glow revealed the far end of the sanctuary. The forgotten god stood there, behind his altar. The statue of the gentle god of rains had a forlorn look. He and his altar were covered with a blanket of dust and cobwebs. Dust lay undisturbed nearly everywhere. Nearly everywhere. She was not the expert tracker Tarma was, but it did not take an expert to read the trail that passed from the front doors to somewhere behind the god statue, and in those dust tracks were paw prints. Desperate to waste no more time, she pulled her blade again and broke into a run, her blue-green witch light bobbing before her, intent on following that trail to wherever it led. She passed by the neglected altar with never a second glance, and found the priest's door at the end of the trace in the dust. It lay just behind and beneath the statue. It had never been intended to be concealed, and, besides, stood wide open. She sent the witchlight shooting ahead of her and sprinted inside, panting a little. But the echoes of running feet ahead of her as she passed into another brick-walled corridor told her that her spell-breaking had not gone unnoticed. Common sense and logic said she should find a corner to put her back against and make a stand. Therefore, she did nothing of the kind. As the first of four armed mercenaries came pounding into view around a corner ahead, she took need in both hands and charged him, shrieking at the top of her lungs. Her berserk attack took the demon hireling by surprise. He stopped dead in his tracks, staring, and belatedly raised his own weapon. His hesitation sealed his doom. Kethry let the eldritch power of need control her body, and the bespelled blade responded to the freedom by moving her in a lightning blow at his unprotected side. Screaming in pain, the fighter fell, arm sheared off at the shoulder. The second hired thug was a little quicker to defend himself, but he too was no match for need's spell-imparted skill. Kethry cracked his wooden shield in half with a strength far exceeding what she alone possessed and swatted his blade out of his hands after only two exchanges, sending it clattering against the wall. She ran him through before he could flee her. The third and fourth sought to take her while, they presumed, Kethry's blade was still held fast in the collapsing body. They presumed too much. Need freed itself and spun Kethry around to meet and counter both their strokes in a display of swordsmanship a master would envy. They saw death staring at them from the witch light reflected on the blood-dripping blade from the hate-filled green eyes. It was more than they had the stomach to face, and their lives were worth far more to them than their pay. They turned and fled back down the way they had come, with Kethry in hot pursuit, too filled with berserk anger now to think that a charge into unknown danger might not be a wise notion. There was light ahead, Kethry noticed absently, allowing her rage to speed her feet. That might mean there were others there, and perhaps the demon. The hirelings ran to the light as to sanctuary. Kethry followed. She stumbled to a halt, at first half-blinded by the light. Then, when her eyes adjusted, Tripped on nothing and nearly fell to her knees, her mind and heart going numb at what she saw. This had once been the inner temple. Thalkarsh had transformed it into his own perverted place of unholiness. It had the red-lit look of a seraglio in hell. It had been decorated with the same sort of carvings that had ornamented the demon's temple back in Delton. The subject was sexual. Every perversion possible was depicted, provided that it included pain and suffering. The far end of the room had been made into a kind of platform, covered in silk and velvet cushions, plushly upholstered. It was a cliched setting, an overdone backdrop for an orgy. The demon certainly enjoyed invoking pain, but it appeared that he himself preferred not to suffer the slightest discomfort while he was amusing himself. The platform was occupied by a clutch of writhing, nude, and partially closed bodies. 
Only now were some of those on the platform beginning to disengage and take notice of the hirelings fleeing for the door on the opposite end. Evidently, not even the demon foresaw that Kethry would be able to get this far on her own. The demon and his followers had been interrupted by her entrance at the height of their pleasures, and it was the sight of the demon's partner that had stricken Kethry to the heart, for the one being used by the demon himself was Tarma. But it was Tarma transformed. She wore the face and body the demon had given her when he had first tried to seduce her to his cause. Though smaller and far frailer, she was still recognizably herself, but with all her angularities softened, her harshness made silken, her flaws turned to beauty. Her clothing was in rags, and she had the bruises and the look of a woman who has been passed from one brutal rape to another. That was bad enough, but that was not what had struck Kethry like a dagger to the heart. It was the absence of any mind or sense in Tarma's blank blue eyes. Tarma had survived rape before. Were she still aware and in charge of herself, she would still be fighting. Mere brutal use would not have forced her mind from her, not when the slaughter of her entire clan, as well as her own abuse, had failed to do that when she was a young woman and far more innocent than she was now. No, this had to be the work of the demon. Knowing he would be unable to break her spirit, Dalkarsh had stolen Tarma's mind, stolen her mind or somehow forced her soul out of her body. The demon, wearing his form of a tall, beautiful human male, was the first to recover from surprise at the interruption. Amusing, he said, not appearing at all amused. I had thought the skill of those I had paid would more than equal yours, even with that puny blade to augment it. It appears that I was mistaken. Before Kethry could make a move, he had seized Tarma and pulled her before him, not as a shield, but with evident threat. Put up your blade, sorceress, he purred brazenly, or... I tear her limb from limb. Kethry knew he was not bluffing, and need clattered to the floor from her nerveless hand. He laughed, a hideous howl of triumph. You disappoint me, my enemy. You have made my conquest too easy. He stood up and tossed Tarma aside. She fell to the pile of cushions with the limpness of a lifeless doll, not even attempting to break her own fall. Come forth, my little toy, he continued, turning his back on his fallen victim and beckoning to someone lurking behind the platform. From out of the shadows among the hangings came a woman, and when she stepped far enough into the light that Kethry was able to get a good look at her, the sorceress reeled as if she had been struck. It couldn't be. The woman was the twin of an image she herself had once worn, and that she had placed on the unconscious form of the marauding bandit Lastel Longknife by way of appropriate punishment for the women and girls he had used and murdered. It was an image she had never expected to see again. She had assumed the bandit would have been treated with brutality equaling his own by what was left of his fellows. By all rights, he should have been dead, long dead. I think the bitch recognizes me, my lord, the dulcet voice said, heavy irony in the title of subservience. Platinum hair was pushed back from amethyst eyes with a graceful but impatient hand. You never expected to see me again, did you? Her eyes blazed with helpless anger. May every god Damn you for what you did to me, woman. Death would have been better than the misery this shape put me through if it hadn't been for a forgotten sword and an untied horse. She came closer, hands crooked into claws. I've dreamed of having you in my hands every night since gods, but not like this. Her eyes betrayed that she was walking a very thin thread of sanity. What you did to me was bad enough, but being trapped in this prison of a horse carcass is more than I can bear. It's worse than hell. It's... She turned away, clenching her hands so tightly that the knuckles popped. 
After a moment of internal struggle, she regained control over herself and turned to the demon. Well, since it was my tales to the priests that lured them here, the time has come for you to keep your side of the bargain. You wish to lose your current form? A pity. I had thought you had come to enjoy my attentions. The woman colored. Kethry was baffled. She had only placed the illusion of being female on the bandit, but this, this was a real woman. Mage sight showed only exactly what stood before her in normal sight, not the bandit of the desert hills. Damn you, she snarled. Oh, gods, for a demon-slaying blade. Yes, you bastard, I enjoy it, as you very well know, squirming like a vile snake inside my head. You've made me your slave, as well as your puppet. You've addicted me to you, and you revel in my misery. You cursed me, far worse than ever she did. And now, damn you, I want free of it, and you, and all else besides. I've paid my part of the bargain. Now you live up to your side. Thalkarsh smiled cruelly. Very well, my pretty little toy. Go and take her lovely throat in both your hands, and I shall free you of that body with her death. One of the acolytes scuttled around behind Kethry and seized her arms, pinioning them behind her back. He needn't have bothered. She was so in shock she couldn't have moved if the ceiling had begun to fall in on them. The slender beauty approached, stark, bitter hatred in her eyes, and seized Kethry's throat. A howl echoed from behind her. A hurtling black shape leaped over her straight at the demon. It was Worrell, who evidently had met the same kind of delaying tactics as Kethry had. Now he had broken free of them, and he was in a killing rage. This time, Thalkarsh took no chances with Worrell. From his upraised hands came double bolts of crimson lightning. Worrell was hit squarely in midair by both of them. He shrieked horribly, transfixed six feet above the floor, caught and held in mid-leap. He writhed once, shrieked again, then went limp. The aura of the demon's magic faded. The body of the Kyrie dropped to the ground like a shot bird and did not move again. Lastel was not in the least distracted by this. She tightened her hands around Kethry's neck. Kethry struggled belatedly to free herself, managing to bring her heel down on the foot of the acolyte behind her, catching him squarely in the instep so that he yowled and dropped to the floor, clutching his ruined foot. But even when her arms were free, she was powerless against the bandit. She scratched at Lastel's hands and reached for her eyes with crooked fingers, uselessly. Her own hands would not respond. Her lungs screamed for air, and she began to black out. The demon laughed and again raised his hands. Kethry felt as if she'd been plunged into the heart of a fire. Crackling energy surrounded both of them. Her legs gave beneath her, and it was only when a new acolyte caught her arms and held her up that she remained erect. With narrowing vision, she stared into Lastel's pale eyes, unable to look away, and suddenly... She found herself staring down into her own face, with her own neck between her hands. Kethry released her grip with a cry of disbelief, stared down at her hands, at herself, horror written plain on her own face. Lastel stared up at her out of her own eyes, hatred and black despair making a twisted mask of her face. The demon laughed at both of them, cruel enjoyment plain in his tone. He eased off the monstrous pile of silks and stalked proudly toward them, sweeping the bandit up onto her feet and into his arms as he came to stand over Kethry, who had sagged to her knees in shock. I promise to change your form, fool. I did not promise into what image. <laughs> he chortled. And you, witch, I have your rightful body in my keeping now, and you will never, never reverse a spell to which I and I alone hold the key. He gestured at his acolyte, who dropped his hold on Kethry, now Lastel, and seized Lastel, now Kethry's arms instead, hauling her roughly to her feet.
My foolish sorceress, my equally foolish toy, how easy it is to manipulate you. Little toy, did you truly think that I would release you when you take such delight in my attentions? That I would allow such a potent source of misery out of my possession? As for you, dear enemy, I have only begun to take my revenge upon you. I shall leave you alive and in full possession of your senses, unlike your sword sister. No doubt you wonder what I have done with her. I have wiped her mind clean. In time I shall implant my teachings in her, so that I shall have an acolyte of complete obedience and complete devotion. It was a pity that I could not force her to suffer as you shall, but her will combined with her link to her chosen goddess was far too strong to trifle with. But now that her mind is gone, the link has gone with it, and she will be mine for as long as I care to keep her. Cathery was overwhelmed with agony and despair. She stifled a moan with difficulty. She felt tears burning her eyes and coursing down her cheeks. Her vision was blurred by them. The demon smiled at the sight. As for you, you will be as potent a source of pain as my little toy is. Know that you will feed my power with your grief and anguish. Know that your blood sister will be my plaything, willingly suffering because I order it. Know all this and know that you are helpless to prevent any of it. As for this... He prodded the body of Whirl with one toe. His smile spread even wider as she tried involuntarily to reach out, only to have the acolytes hold her arms back. I think that I shall find something suitable to use it for. Shall I have it mounted? Oh, yes, the fur is quite good, quite soft and unusual. I think... I shall have it tanned, and it shall be your only bed, my enemy. He laughed as Kethry struggled in the arms of his acolytes, stomach twisted and mind torn nearly in shreds by her grief and hatred of him. She subsided only when they threatened to wrench her arms out of their sockets and hung limply in their grasp, panting with frustrated rage and weeping soundlessly. Take her and take her friend. Put them in the place I prepared for them, Thalkash ordered with a lift of one eyebrow. And take that and that as well. He indicated the body of Whirl and Kethry's sword need. Put them where she can see them until I decide what to do with them. Perhaps, little toy, I shall give the blade to you. Lastel's hands clenched and unclenched as he attempted to control himself. Do it, damn you! If you do, I'll use it on you, you bastard! How kind of you to warn me, then, but come. You wear a new body now, and I wish to see how it differs from the old, don't you? Kethry's last sight of the demon was as he swept Lastel up onto the platform. Then she and Tarma were hustled down another brick-lined corridor and shoved roughly into a makeshift cage that took up the back half of a stone-lined storage room. Worrell's carcass and need were both dumped unceremoniously on the slate table in front of the cage door. The room lacked windows entirely and had only the one door now shut and, from the sounds that had come after her guards had shut it, locked. Light came from a single torch in a holder near the door. The cage was made of crudely forged iron bars welded across the entire room, with an equally crude door of similar bars that had been padlocked closed. There was nothing whatsoever in the cage. She and Tarma had only what they were wearing, which in Tarma's case was little more than rags, and in hers, the simple shift in breeches Lastel had been wearing. Though she searched... She found no weapons at all. Tarma sat blank-eyed in the corner of the cage where she'd been left, rocking back and forth and humming tunelessly to herself. The only thing that the demon hadn't changed was her voice, still the ruined parody of what it had been 
before the slaughter of her clan. Kethry went to her and knelt on the cold stone at her side. Tama, she asked, taking her Shienadra's hand in hers and staring into those blank blue eyes. She got no response for a moment. Then the eyes seemed to see her. One hand crept up, and Tarma inserted the tip of her index finger into her mouth. Tarma, the Shinain echoed ingenuously. And that was all of intelligence that Kethry could coax from her. Within moments, her eyes had gone blank again, and she was back to her rocking and tuneless humming. Kethry looked from the mindless Tarma to the body of the Kyrie and back again, slow tears etching their way down her cheeks. My God, my God, she wept. Oh, Tama, you were right. We should have gone for help. She tried to take her oathkin in her arms, but it was like holding a stiff wooden doll. If I hadn't been so damned sure of myself, if I hadn't been so determined to prove you were smothering me, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. What have I done? What has my pride done to you? And Tarma rocked and crooned, oblivious to everything around her, while she wept with absolute despair. Chapter 11 You lied to me, you bastard! Green eyes blazed passionately with anger. You didn't listen carefully enough. Thalkarsh replied to the amber-haired Hellion whom he had backed into a corner of his couch. I said I would change your form. I never said what I would change it into. You never had any intention of changing me back to a man. Lastel choked, sagging to the padded platform, almost incoherent with rage. Quite right, <laughs> the demon grinned maliciously as he sat himself cross-legged on the padded platform, carefully positioning himself so as to make escape impossible. Your emotions are strong, you are a potent source of power for me, and an ever-renewable source. I had no intention of letting you free of me while I still need you. <laughs> He arranged himself more comfortably, with the aid of a cushion or two. He had Lastil neatly pinned, and his otherworldly strength and speed would enable him to counter any move the woman made. Then, when? When shall I release you, fool? Don't you ever think past the immediate moment? For once, the molten bronze face lost its mocking expression. The glowing red-gold eyes looked frustrated. Why should you want release? What would you do if I gave you back your previous form? Where would you go? Back to your wastelands? Back to misery? Back to petty theft? Back to a life with every man's hand against you? Having to hide like a desert rat? Is that what you want? I... Fool. Blind, stupid fool. Your lust for power is nearly as great as my own, yet you could accomplish nothing by yourself and everything with my aid. <laughs> the demon rose to his feet, gesticulating. Think. For one moment, think. You are in a mage-talented body now, one in which the currents of arcane power flow strongly. You could have me as a patron. You could have all the advantages of being my own high prelate when I am made a god. And you wish to throw this all away simply because you do not care for the responses of a perfectly healthy and attractive body. But it isn't mine. It's a woman. Lastil shrank back into the corner, wailing, I don't want this body. But I want you in it. 
I desire you, creature I have made. I want you in a form attractive to me. The demon came closer and placed his hands on the walls to either side of Lastel, effectively rendering her immobile. Your emotions run so high and taste so sweetly to me that I sometimes think I shall never release you. Why? Lastel whispered. Why me, why this, and why here? I thought all your kind hated this world. Not I. The demon's eyes smoldered as his expression turned thoughtful. Your world is beautiful in my eyes. Your people have aroused more than my hunger. They have aroused my desire. I want this world, and I want the people in it, and I will have it, just as I shall have you. No, Lastel whimpered. Then I ask in turn, why? Or why not? What have I done save rouse your own passions? You are well fed, well clothed, well housed, nor have I ever harmed you physically. You're killing me! Lastel cried, his voice breaking. You're destroying my identity! Every time you look at me, every time you touch me, I forget what it was ever like being a man. All I want is to be your shadow, your servant. I want to exist only for you. I never come back to myself until after you've gone, and it takes longer to remember what I was afterward, longer every time you do this to me. The demon smiled again with his former cruelty and brought his lips in to brush her neck. Then, little toy, he murmured, perhaps it is something best forgotten. Tarma was lost, without sight, without hearing, without senses of any kind, held there and drained weak past any hope of fighting back. So tired, too tired to fight, too tired to hope or even care, emptied of every passion. Wake up! The thin voice in her mind was the first sign that there was any life at all in the vast emptiness where she abode, alone. She strained to hear it again, feeling... Something, something besides the apathy that had claimed her. Mind, mate, wake. It was familiar. If only she could remember. Remember anything at all. Wake, wake, wake. The voice was stronger and had the feel of teeth in it, as if something large and powerful was closing fangs on her and shaking her. Teeth. In the name of the star-eyed, the voice said frantically, you must wake. Teeth. Star-eyed. Those things had meant something before she had become nothing, had meant something when she was Tarma. She was Tarma. She was Tarma still, sworn one, Kyrie friend, Shienedra. Every bit of her identity that she regained brought more tiny pieces back with it and more strength. She fought off the gray fog that threatened to steal those bits away, fought and held them, and put more and more of herself together, fighting back inch by inch. She was Shinain, of the free folk of the open plains. She would not be held imprisoned. She would not be held. Now she felt pain and welcomed it, for it was one more bridge to reality. Salvation lay in pain, not in the gray fog that sucked 
the pain and everything else away from her. She held the pain to her, cherished it, and reached for the voice in her mind. She found that, too, and held to it, while it rejoiced fiercely that she had found it. No, not it, he, the Kyrie, the mage-beast, Worrell, the friend of her soul, as Kethry was of her heart. As if that recognition had broken the last strand of foul magic holding her in the gray place, she suddenly found herself possessed again of a body, a body that ached in a way that was only too familiar, a body stiff and chilled and sitting from the feel of the air on her skin, nearly naked and on a cold stone floor. She could hear nothing but the sound of someone crying softly, and cautiously cracked her eyes open the merest slit to see where she was. She was in a cage. She could see the iron bars before her, but unless she changed position and moved, she couldn't see much else. She closed her eyes again in an attempt to remember what could have brought her to this pass. Her memories tumbled together, confused, as she tried with an aching skull to sort them out. But after a moment, it all came back to her, and with it, a rush of anger and hatred. Thalkarsh. The demon. He'd tricked her, trapped her, then overpowered her, changed her, and done something to send her into that gray place. But if Thalkarsh had taken her, then where were Worrell and Kethry? I'm lying on the table, mind mate, said the voice. The demon thinks he killed me. He nearly did. His magic sent me into little death, and I decided to continue the trance until we were all alone. It seemed safer that way. There was nothing I could do for you. Your Shienedra is in the same cage as you. It would be nice to let her know the demon hasn't destroyed your mind after all. She thinks that you're worse than dead, and blames herself entirely for what was both your folly. Tarma moved her head cautiously. Her muscles all ached. There was someone in the cage with her, crumpled in a heap in the corner, by the shaking of her shoulders, the source of the weeping, but that's not Kathry. Not her body, but her spirit. The demon gave her body to the bandit. What bandit? The Kyrie gave a mental growl. It's too hard to explain. I'm going to break the trance. Tend to your Shienedra. Tarma licked lips that were swollen and bruised. She'd felt this badly used once before, a time she preferred not to think about. There was something missing. Something missing. No, she whispered, eyes opening wide with shock, all thought driven from her in that instant by her realization of what was missing. Oh, no! The stranger's head snapped up. Swollen and red-rimmed amethyst eyes turned toward her. T -t Tarma! It's gone! She choked, unable to comprehend her loss. The Vizaka! The goddess Bond! It's gone! She could feel her sanity slipping, feel herself going over the edge without the goddess Bond. Take hold of yourself! The voice in her mind snapped. It's probably all that damn demon's fault. Break his spells and it will come back. And anyway, you're alive and I'm alive and Kethry's alive and I want us all to stay that way. Worrell's annoyance was like a slap in the face. It brought her back to a precarious sanity. And with his reminder that Kethry was still alive, she turned back toward the stranger whose tear-streaked face peered through the gloom at her. Geth, is that you? You're back! Oh, goddess, bless, you're back! The platinum-haired beauty flung herself into Tarma's arms and clung there. I thought he destroyed you, and it was all my fault for insisting that we do this ourselves instead of going for help like you wanted. Here now. Tarma gulped back tears of her own and pushed Kethry away with hands that shook. We're not out of this yet. Tarma, Worrell, he's very much alive, thank you. The great furry shape on the table outside their cage rose slowly to its four feet and shook itself painfully. 
I hurt. If you hurt like I hurt, we are all in very sad condition. Tarma sympathized with Kethri's bewilderment. He pulled a Kyrie trick on us all, Shianidra. He told me that when the demon's magic hit him, it sent him into little death, a kind of trance. He figured it was better to stay that way until we were alone. She examined the confused countenance before her. He also said something about you trading bodies with a bandit. And don't I know that face? Last a long knife, she replied shakily. He lived. He's the one that had Thalkash conjured up, and I guess he got more than he bargained for, because the demon turned him into a real woman. He was the one spreading the rumors to lure us in here, I'll bet. Now he's got my body. I have the sinking feeling that you're going to tell me you can't work magic in this one. Not very well, she admitted. Though I haven't tried any of the power magics that need more training than talent. All right, then. We can't magic our way out of this cage. Let's see if we can think our way out. Tarma did her best to ignore the aching void within her and took careful stock of the situation. Their prison consisted of the back half of a stone-walled room. Crude iron bars welded across the middle made their half into a cage. It had an equally crude door, padlocked shut. There was only one door to the room itself, in the front half, and there were no windows. The floor was of slate. In half of the room beyond their cage was a table on which Worrell and something else lay. Furface, is that need next to you? The same. Then Thalkarsh just made one big mistake, she said narrowing her eyes with grim satisfaction. Get your tail over here and bring the blade with you. Worrell snorted, picked up the hilt of the blade gingerly in his mouth, and jumped down off the table with it. He dragged it across the floor, complaining mentally to Tarma the entire time. All right, Keth, I saw that thing sheer clean through armor and more than once. Have a crack at the latch. It'll have to be you. She won't answer physically to me. But Kethry looked doubtfully at the frail arms of her new body, then told herself sternly to remember that need was a magical weapon, that it responded, as the runes on its blade said, to woman's need. And they certainly needed out of this prison. She raised the sword high over her head and brought it down on the latch bar with all of her strength. With a shriek like a dying thing, the metal sheared neatly in two, and the door swung open. You are bold, priest, the demon rumbled. I am curious, perhaps foolish, but never bold, responded the plump, balding priest of Anathai. I was curious when I first heard the rumors of your return. I was even more curious when the two who were responsible for your defeat before were missing this morning. I will confess to being quite confused to find one of them here. He cast a meaningful glance at the demon's companion, curled sullenly on the velvet beside him. The sorceress did not appear to be happy, but she also did not appear coerced in any way. Come to that, there was something oddly different about her. I repeat, you are bold, but you amuse me. Why are you here? Thalkarsh settled back onto his cushions, and with a flicker of thought, increased the intensity of the light coming from his crimson lanterns. The musky incense he favored wafted upward toward the ceiling from a brazier at the edge of the padded platform where he reclined. This priest had presented himself at the door and simply asked to be taken to the demon. Thalkarsh's followers had been so nonplussed by his quiet air of authority that they had done as he asked. Now he stood before Thalkarsh, an unimpressive figure in a plain brown cassock, plump and aging, with his hands tucked into the sleeves of his robe. And he, in his turn, did not seem the least afraid of the demon, nor did it appear that anything 
From the obscene carvings to the orgy still in progress on the platform behind the demon was bothering him the slightest bit. And that had the demon thoroughly puzzled. I am here to try to convince you that what you are doing is wrong. 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 <laughs> The demon laughed heartily. I could break you with one finger. And you wish to tell me that I am guilty of doing wrong? Since you seem to wish to live in this world, you must live by some of its rules, and one of those is that to cause harm or pain to another is wrong. And... Who will punish me, priest? The demon's eyes glowed redly, his lips thinning in anger. You? You yourself will cause your own punishment, the priest replied earnestly. For by your actions, you will drive away what even you must need. Admiration, trust, friendship, love, he was interrupted by the sound of shouting and of clashing blades. He stared in surprise to see Tarma, a transformed Tarma, wearing an acolyte's tunic and nothing else, charging into the room driving several guards ahead of her, and with her was the platinum-haired child he had last seen at his own temple, telling his brothers of the rumors of Thalkarsh. But the blade in her hands was the one he had last seen in the sorceress's hands. The woman at the demon's side made a tight little sound of smothered rage as the demon's guards moved to bar the exits or interposed themselves between the women and their target. Your anger is strong, little toy, Thalkarsh laughed, looking down at her. Use it, then. Become the instrument of my revenge. Kill her, and this time I promise you that I shall give you your man's body back. He plucked a sword from the hand of the guard next to him and handed it to his amber-tressed companion, and the priest stared in complete bewilderment. Given the weapon, the bandit needed no further urging and flung himself at Kethry's throat. Kethry, now no longer the tough, fit creature she had been, but a frail, delicate wraith went down before him. Tarma tried to get to her, knowing that she was going to be too late, but Worrell intervened, bursting from behind the crimson velvet hangings, flinging himself between the combatants long enough for Kethry to regain her footing and recover need. She fumbled it up into a pathetic semblance of guard position, then stared at her own hands, wearing a stupefied expression. After a moment, Tarma realized why. Need was not responding to her, because need could not act against a woman, not even for a woman. And between Tarma and Hershianidra were a dozen or so followers of the demon. But some of them were the ones who had so lately been sharing her own body with their master. She let herself, for the first time since her awakening, truly realize what had been done to her, physically and mentally. Within an eye blink, she had roused herself to a killing battle frenzy, a state in which all her senses were heightened, her reactions quickened, her strength nearly doubled. She would pay for this energized state later, if there was a later. She gathered herself carefully and sprang at the nearest, taking with her one of the heavy silken hangings that had been nearest her. She managed despite the handicap of no longer having her rightful battle-trained body to catch him by surprise and tangle him in the folds of it. The only weapon the Shinain had been able to find had been a heavy dagger. Before the others had a chance to react to her first rush, she stabbed down at him, taking a fierce pleasure in plunging it into him again and again until the silk was dyed scarlet with his blood. Kethry was defending herself as best she could, only the fact that the bandit was once again not in a body that was his own was giving her any chance at all. Worrell's appearance had given her a brief moment of aid when she most needed it.
Now Worrell was busy with one of the other acolytes, and it was apparent that Tarma too had her hands full, though she was showing a good portion of her old speed and skill. At least she wasn't in that shocked and bereft half day she'd fallen into when she first came back to herself. But Kethry had enough to think about. She could only spare a scant second to rejoice at Tarma's recovery. She was doing more dodging than anything else. The bandit was plainly out for her death. As had occurred once before, the demon was merely watching, content to let his pawns play out their moves before making any of his own. Tarma had taken a torch and set the trapped acolyte aflame, laughing wildly when he tried to free himself of the entangling folds of the silk coverlet and succeeding only in getting in the way of those that remained. Worrell had disposed of one and was heading off a second. Kethry was facing a terrible dilemma. Need was responding sluggishly now, but only in pure defense. She knew she dared not kill the former bandit. If she did, there would be no chance of ever getting her own body back. There was no way of telling what would happen if she killed what was, essentially, her body. She might survive, trapped in this helpless form that lacked the stamina and strength and mage talents of her own, or she might die along with her body. Nor did she have any notion of what need might do to her if she killed another woman. Possibly nothing, or the magical backlash of breaking the Gesh might well leave her a burned-out husk, a fate far worse than simply dying. Now Tarma had laid hands on another sword, one lighter than the broadsword she was used to and with an odd curve to it. She had never used a weapon quite like this before, but a blade was a blade. The rest of the acolytes made a rush for her, forgetting for the moment, if indeed they had ever known, that they were not dealing with an essentially helpless woman, given momentary strength by hysteria, but a highly trained martial artist. Tarma's anger and hysteria were as carefully channeled as a powerful stream diverted to turn a mill. As they rushed her, evidently intending to overpower her by sheer numbers, she took the hilt in both hands, rose and pivoted in one motion, and made a powerful, sweeping cut at waist level that literally sliced four of them in half. Somewhere, far in the back of her mind, a normally calm, analytical part of her mind went wild with joy. This strange sword was better than any blade she'd ever used before. The curve kept it from lodging. The edge was as keen as the breath of the north wind, and the grip, with a place for her to curl her forefinger around it, made it almost an extension of her hand. It was perfectly balanced for use by either one hand or two. Her eyes lit with a kind of fire, and it wasn't all the reflection of torch flames. Her remaining opponents stumbled over the bleeding, disemboweled bodies of their erstwhile comrades, shocked and numb by the turn in fortunes. Just last night, this woman had been their plaything. Now she stood, blood-spattered and half-naked as she was, over the prone bodies of five of them. They hesitated, confused. Worrell leapt on two from the rear, breaking the neck of one and driving the other onto Tarma's waiting blade. Eight down, seven standing, seven. There were only six. Tarma felt more than saw the approach of one from the rear. She pivoted, slashing behind her with the marvelously liquid blade as she did so, and caught him across the throat. Even as he went down, another, braver than the rest, lunged for her. Her kick caught him in the temple. His head snapped to one side, and he fell, eyes glazing with more than unconsciousness. Worrell made sure of him with a single snap of his massive jaws, then dashed away again to vanish somewhere. Five. I come from behind you. Tarma held her ground, and Worrell ran in from under the hangings. The man he jumped had both a short sword and shield, but failed to bring either up in time. Worrell tore his throat out and leapt away, leaving him to drown in his own blood. Four. Tarma charged between two of those remaining, slashing with a figure-eight motion. Knowing they would hesitate to strike at her with the swords they'd snatched from their sheaths for fear of striking each other. She caught the first across the eyes, the second across the gut. 
The one she'd blinded stumbled toward her with blood pouring between his fingers, and she finished him as she whirled around at the end of her rush. Two. Kethry tried to simply defend herself, but the bandit wasn't holding back. So she did the only thing she could. She cast Need away from her and backed off far enough to raise her hands over her head, preparatory to blasting the bandit with a bolt of arcane power. Worrell leaped on the right-hand man, tore at his thigh and brought him down, then ripped out his gut. Tarma's final opponent was the first that showed any real ability or forethought. He was crouching where Worrell couldn't come at him from the rear, with a sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. His posture showed he was no stranger to the blade. She knew after a feint or two that he was very good, which was probably why he'd survived his other companions. Now she had a problem. There was no one to get in his way, and the unfamiliar feel of her transformed body was a distraction and a handicap. Then she saw his eyes narrow as she moved her new sword slightly and knew she had a psychological weapon to use against him. This was his blade she held, and he wanted it back very badly. She made her plan and moved. She pretended to make a short rush, then pretended to stumble, dropping the sword. When he grabbed for it, dropping his own blade, Tarma snatched a torch from the wall beside her and thrust it at his face. And when he winced away from it, grabbed a dagger from the litter of weapons on the floor and flung it straight for his throat. Knowing that marksmanship was not a thing that depended on weight and balance, but on the coordination of hand and eye, things that wouldn't change even though her body had shifted form considerably. As he went down, gurgling and choking, to drown in his own blood like one of the men Worrell had taken out, she saw that Kethry was being forced to take the offensive, and saw the look of smug satisfaction on the demon's face as she did so, and she realized with a sudden flash of insight that they had played right into his hands. Why do you do nothing? the little priest asked in pure confusion. Because this is a test, human, the demon replied, watching with legs stretched out comfortably along the platform. I have planned for this, though I shall admit candidly to you that I did not expect this moment to come quite so soon, nor did I expect that the beast should regain its life and the swordswoman her mind, but these are minor flaws in my plan. However it comes out, I shall win. As you may have guessed, it is the sorceress's spirit that inhabits my servant's body. Should he slay her, I shall be well rid of her, and my servant in possession of a mage-talented form. Should the swordswoman die, I shall be equally well rid of her. Should she live, I shall simply deal with her as I did before." Should my servant die, I shall still have the sorceress, and her gesh blade will blast her for harming a woman, even though she does not hold it in her hand, for she has been soul-bonded to it, and that will render her useful to me. Or should it kill her, she may well be damned to my realm for the breaking of the oaths she swore." So you see, no matter the outcome, I win, and I am in no danger, for only my own magics could touch me in any way. I see, the priest replied, staring at the bloody combat before them, mesmerized by the sight. Tarma realized that they were once again playing right into the demon's hands, for if Kethry killed the one wearing her form, she would damn herself irrevocably, once by committing a kind of suicide, and twice by breaking the gesh and the vow her bond with need had set upon her, never to raise her hand against a woman, three times by breaking her oath to her Shienidra. And by such a betrayal, she would probably die, for surely Thalkarsh had warded his creature against magics, or need would blast her into death or mindlessness. Should she die, 
she could damn herself forever to Thalkarsh's particular corner of the abyssal plain, putting herself eternally in his power. It was a good bet. He had planned that she must slay the bandit by magic, since need would not serve against a woman, and certainly he had woven a spell that would backlash all her unleashed power on the caster. Kethry would be worse than dead, for she would be his for the rest of time, to wreak revenge on until even he should grow weary of it. Unless Tarma could stop her before she committed such self-damnation, and with time running out, there was only one way to save her. With an aching heart, she cried out in her mind to Worrell, and Worrell responded with the lightning-fast reactions of the Kyrie kind, born in magic and bred of it. He leapt upon the unsuspecting Kethry from the rear, and with one crunch of his jaws, broke her neck and collapsed her windpipe. Both Kethry and the bandit collapsed. Tarma scrambled after the discarded mage blade, conscious now only of a dim urge to keep Kethry's treasured weapon out of profane hands, and to use the thing against the creature that had forced her to kill the only human she cared for. Need had hurt the demon before— but she had forgotten one thing. She wasn't a mage. So Need's other gift came into play. The gift that protected a woman warrior from magic, no matter how powerful. No magic not cast with the consent of the bearer could survive Need entering its field. The spell binding Tarma was broken, and she found herself in a body that had regained its normal proportions. This was just such a moment that the priest had been praying for. The spell energy binding Kethry into Lastil's body was released explosively with the death blow. The priest took full control of that energy and snatched her spirit before death had truly occurred. Using the potent energies released, he sent Lastil's spirit and Kethry's back to their proper containers. There were still other energies being released, those binding Lastil's form into a woman's shape, and those altering Tarma. Quicker than thought, the priest gained hold of those as well. With half of his attention, he erected a shield over the swordswoman and her partner. With the other, he sent those demon-born magics hurtling back to their caster. Kethry had been stunned by Worrell's apparent treachery, had actually felt herself dying, and now, suddenly, found herself very much alive and back in her proper body. She sat up, blinking in surprise. Beside her on the marble floor was a dead man, wearing the garments she herself had worn as Lastel. Worrell stood over him, growling, every hair on end. But her mage sense for energy told her that the tale had not yet seen its end. As if to confirm this, a howl of anguish rose behind her. No! The voice began as a brazen bass and spiraled up to a fragile soprano. Kethry twisted around, staring in astonishment. Behind her was Thalkarsh, a demon no longer, a male no longer. Instead, from out of the amethystine eyes of the delicate mortal creature he had mockingly called his toy, stared Thalkarsh's hell-spawn spirit, dumbfounded, glassy-eyed with shock, hardly able to comprehend what had happened to him, powerless now, and as female and fragile as either of the two he had thought to take revenge upon, and a great deal more helpless. This cannot... She whispered, staring at her thin hands. I cannot have failed. My poor friend. The little priest, whom Kethry had overlooked in the fight, having eyes only for the demon, his servants, and Lastel, reached for one of the demon's hands with true and courageous sympathy. I fear you have worked to wreak only your own downfall, as I warned you would happen. No! And you have wrought far too well, I fear, for if I read this spell correctly, it was meant to be permanent unto death, and as a demon, except that you be slain by a specific blade, 
you cannot die. Am I not correct? The demon's only response was a whimper, as she sank into a heap of loose limbs among the cushions of what once had been her throne, her eyes fogging as she retreated from the reality she herself had unwittingly created. Tarma let her long legs fold under her and sat where she had stood, trembling from head to toe, saying nothing at all, a look of glazed pain in her eyes. Kethry dragged herself to Tarma's side and sat down with a thump. Now what? Tarma asked, in a voice dulled by emotional and physical exhaustion, rubbing her eyes with one hand. Now what are we going to do with him? I... I don't know. I shall take charge of her, the priest said. She is in no state to be a threat to us, and we can easily keep her in a place from which she shall find escape impossible until she has a true change of heart. My child, he addressed himself to Tarma, concern in his eyes. What is amiss? My bond. It's gone. She looked up at the priest's round, anxious face and the look in her eyes was of one completely lost. Would you fetch my fellows from the temple? He asked Kethry. That one is locked within herself, but I may have need of them. Gladly, Kethry replied. But can you help her? I will know better when you return. She ran, or tried to, to fetch the little priest's fellow devotees. She all but forced herself past a skeptical novice left to guard the door by night. The noise she made when she finally was driven to lose her temper and shout at him brought the high prelate of Anathai to the door himself. He was more than half asleep, wrapped in a blanket, but he came awake soon enough when she'd begun to relate the night's adventures. He snapped out a series of orders that were obeyed with such prompt alacrity that Kethry's suspicions as to their friend's true rankings were confirmed long before three novices brought her his robes, those of an archpriest, and half the members of the order new roused from their beds. Though simple, hardly more ornate than what he had worn to the inn, the robes radiated power that Kethry could feel even without invoking mage senses. A half-dozen other members of his order scurried away from the convocation at the cloister door and came back wearing ceremonial garments and carrying various arcane implements. Kethry led the procession of cowled, laden priest mages through the pre-dawn streets at a fast trot. The night watch took one look at the parade and respectfully stepped aside, not even bothering with hailing them. When she got them as far as the open door of the temple, her own strength gave out, and she stopped to rest, half collapsed against the smiling image of the rain god. By the time she reached the inner sanctum, they had the situation well in hand. The bodies had been carried off somewhere, the obscene carvings shrouded, a good deal of the blood cleaned up, and, most importantly, Thalkarsh, placed under such tight arcane bindings that not even a demigod could have escaped. I believe I can restore what was lost to your friend, the priest said, when Kethry finally gathered up enough courage to approach him. But I shall need the assistance of both yourself and the Kyrie. Certainly. Anything. But why? It will help if I know what I'm supposed to be doing. You are familiar with her goddess, and as Shinain adopted, she shall hear you where she might not hear me. You might think of yourself as the arrow and myself as the bow. I can lend your wish the power to reach the star-eyed, but only you of all of us know her well enough to pick her aspect from all the other aspects of the lady." Logical. What do I do? Worrell says, whatever you want, he'll do. Just try to tell her, warrior, that the bond has been broken and needs to be restored, or Tama may well die or go mad, which is the same thing for a Shinain. 
Catherine knelt at the priest's feet on the cold marble of the desecrated temple floor, Worrell at her side. Tarma remained where she was, sunk in misery and loss so deep that she was as lost to the world around her as Thalkarsh was. Kethry concentrated with all her soul as the priest murmured three words and placed his hand on her head and Tarma's in blessing. Please, lady, please hear me, she thought in despair, watching Tarma's dead eyes. I've... I've been less understanding than I could have been. I forgot, because I wanted to, that I'm all the clan she has left. I only thought of the freedom I thought I was losing. I don't know you, but maybe you know me. There was no answer, and Cathery shut her eyes in mental agony. Please hear us. Even if you don't give a damn about us, she pledged herself to you. Foolish child. The voice in her mind startled her. It was more like music than a voice. I am nothing but another face of your own lady Windborne. How could I not know you? Both of you have been wrong, but you have wrought your own punishment. Now, forgive yourselves as you forgive each other and truly be the two made one. Catherine nearly fainted at the rush of pure power that passed through her. When it ebbed, she steadied herself and glanced up in surprise. The little priest was just removing his hand from Tarma's bowed head. His brow was damp with sweat, but relief showed in the smiling line of his mouth. As Tarma looked up, Catherine saw her expression change from one of pathetic bereavement to the utter relief of one who has regained something thought gone forevermore. A heavy burden of fear passed from Catherine's heart at the change. She closed her eyes and breathed her own prayer of thanks. So profound was her relief that it was several moments before she realized Tarma was speaking to the priest. I don't know how to— Then don't thank me, he interrupted. I simply reopened what the demon had closed, my pleasure and my duty, just as tending to the demon as she is now is my duty. You're certain you people can keep him, or should I say her, from any more trouble? She asked doubtfully of her erstwhile debating partner, as Cathry shook off her weariness and looked up at them. To the sorceress's profound gratitude, Tarma looked to be most of the way back to normal, a rapid recovery. But Cathry was used to rapid recoveries from the Shinain. The face she turned to Cathry was calm and sane once again, with a hint of her old sense of humor. She reached out a hand, and Tarma caught it and squeezed it once, without taking her attention from the priest. Sworn one, we are placing every safeguard known to mortal man upon her and the place where we shall keep her, the little priest said soberly. The being Thalkash shall have no opportunity for escape. Her only chance will be to truly change, for the spells we shall use will not hold against an angelic spirit, only one of evil intent. Truly, you have given us the opportunity we have long dreamed of. Well, Tarma actually grinned, though it was weakly. After all, it isn't every day someone can present you with a captive demon to preach to. Not to put too fine a point on it, we're giving you folk a chance to prove yourselves. She managed a ghost of a chuckle. Though I'll admit I had no notion you were capable of restraining demons so handily. As you yourself pointed out, Sworn One, when one goes to preach to demons, the preacher had best be either agile or a very fine magician. The balding priest's brown eyes vanished in smile wrinkles. And, as your partner has rightly told me, while Thalkash seems helpless now, there is no guarantee that she will remain so. We prefer to take no chance, 
as you say, this is our unlooked-for opportunity to prove the truth of our way to the entire world, and, as such, we are grateful to you beyond telling. With that, the little priest bowed to both of them, and his train of underlings brought the once demon to her feet, bound by spells that at the moment were scarcely needed. She was numbly submissive, and they guided her out the way they had come, bound for their own temple. Kethri got to her feet and silently held out her hand to Tarma, who took it once again with no sign of resentment and pulled herself to her feet by it. They left the scene of slaughter without a backward glance, moving as quickly as their aching bodies would allow, eager to get out into the clean air. Warrior's Oath! How long have we been in there? Tarma exclaimed on seeing the thin sliver of moon and the positions of the stars. About twenty-four candle marks. It's tomorrow morning. Is... that's not your sword, is it? Kathry, lagging a little behind, saw that the shape strapped to Tarma's back was all wrong. No disaster without some benefit, Chianidra. Tarma lifted a hand to caress the unfamiliar hilt. I've never in my life had a weapon like this one. There's no magic to it beyond exquisite balance, fantastic design, and the finest steel I've ever seen, but it is without a doubt the best blade I've ever used. It acted like part of my arm, and you're going to have to cut off that arm to get it away from me. Briefly alarmed by her vehemence, Kethry stretched weary mage senses one more time, fearing to find that the blade was some kind of ensorcelled trap or bore a curse. She found nothing and sighed with relief. Tarma was right. There was no hint of magic about the blade, and her partner's reaction was nothing more than that of any warrior who has just discovered her ideal dreamed-of weapon. They limped painfully back to their inn, with Worrell trailing behind as guard against night thugs, stopping now and then to rest against a handy wall or building. The night watch recognized Kethry and waved them on. The cool, clean air was heavenly after the incense and perfume-laden choke of the temple. When they finally reached their inn, they used the latch string on their window to let themselves back inside and felt their way into their room with only the banked embers of the hearth fire for light. Kethry expended a last bit of mage power and lit a candle, while Tarma dropped her weapons wearily. Beds had never looked so inviting before, and yet neither was quite ready to sleep. This time we've really done it, haven't we? Tarma ventured, easing her borrowed boots off her feet and pitching them out the open window for whoever should find them in the morning to carry away. She stripped as quickly as her cuts and bruises would permit, and the clothing followed the boots as the Shinain grimaced in distaste. Kathry handed her clean breeches and an under-tunic from her pack, and Tarma eased herself into them with a sigh and numerous winces. You mean we've locked him up for good? I think so, at least insofar as I can ever be sure of anything and we aren't going to make the mistake of forgetting about him again. Lady Bright, not bloody likely, Tarma shuddered. We'll be getting messages from the temple every two months, like clockwork. That was part of the agreement I made with little Nemor. Huh, think of him as archpriest. Seems logical now, but he sure doesn't look the part. Until he puts on the authority... I could almost feel sorry for old Dalkosh. I can't imagine a worse punishment for a demon than to have sweetness and light preached at him for as long as he lives, which might well be forever. And besides, Tarma smiled, getting up with a muffled groan and another grimace, and walking over to the window. She leaned out, letting the breeze lift her hair and cool her face. Who knows? They might succeed in redeeming him. Tama, all this, we both nearly died. 
I would have died with a broken promise to you on my soul. Cathery paused for a long moment, so long that Tarma was afraid she wasn't going to finish what she had begun to say. She turned from looking out the window to regard her partner soberly, knowing that Cathery had something troubling her gravely. Even Worrell looked up from where he lay on Tarma's bed, ears pricked and eyes unfathomable. Finally, Cathery sighed and continued. I guess what I want to ask you is this. Do you want me, us, to stop this wandering, to go back to the plains? After all, it's me that's been keeping us on the road, not you. I haven't found any man I'd care to spend more than a night or two with, but that really doesn't matter to my promise. It doesn't take liking to get children. Oh, hell, there's always Justin and Iken. I do like them well enough to share a bed with them for a bit. And once we had some children, I could keep myself in practice easily enough. I could establish a white wind school even without the cash. I'm getting close enough to adept to do that now. I'd rather have better circumstances to do that than we have right now, but I could scrape along. We certainly have the reputation now to attract good pupils. Tarma turned back to gaze up at the waning moon, troubled. It was true that the most important thing in the world to her was the refounding of her slaughtered clan, and they had nearly died without being any closer to that goal. There were times when she longed for the tents of her people in the open plains with all her soul, and there were other negatives to this life they were leading, there was no guarantee something like this couldn't happen again. Being gang-raped, or so she suspected, had been the least of the unspeakable things she'd suffered unaware in Thalkarsh's hands. Far worse was the absence of the star-eyed's presence in her soul when she'd returned to herself. And when her goddess had not returned to her with Thalkarsh's transformation, she'd been afraid for a moment that the warrior would not take her back with her celibacy violated. That had turned out to be a foolish fear, as her priest friend had proved to her. No sooner had he cleansed her of the last of Thalkarsh's magic bindings than she felt the warrior's cool and supportive presence once again in her heart. The asexual psychic armor of the sword sworn closed around her again, and she could regard the whole experience as something to learn and benefit from. She was heart whole and healed again, in spirit if not in body. Still, none of this would have happened if they'd returned to the plains. In the very home of the goddess of the four winds, the demon would have been powerless, no matter what he had claimed. The bandit, would never have made his way past the outer clans, and, warrior's oath, how Tarma longed to see the Talisadrine banner flying above a full encampment with bright-faced children within and fat herds without. Cathry's wandering feet had nearly caused their deaths this time, and Talisadrine had nearly died with them. And her clan, as for any Shinain, was the most important thing in Tarma's life. But no, it wasn't the most important thing, not anymore. Not if Kethri was going to be made a captive to see that dream achieved. A willing captive she would be, perhaps, but still a captive. Kethri had been right. She had been stifling her friend, and with the best of intentions— she had been putting invisible hobbles on her, or trying to. Her Shinain soul rebelled at the notion. You do not hobble your hound, your horse, your hawk, your lover, or your Shienadrin, went the saying. Love must live free. A prisoner was a prisoner, no matter how willingly the bonds were taken, and how truly Shinain could Kethri be bound. And if she were not Shinain in her heart, how could her children follow the clan ways with whole spirits? And yet, and yet, 
there remained Kethry's oath and her dream. If Kethry died. She closed her eyes and emptied her heart and hoped for an answer. And miraculously, one came. A tiny breath of chill wind wafted out of the north and coiled around her body, enclosing her in silence. And in that silence, an ageless voice spoke deep in her soul. What is your clan but your sister? Trust in her as your left hand blade, as she trusts in you, and you shall keep each other safe. Tarma's heart lifted, and she turned back to face her partner with a genuine smile. What? And turn you into another Shinain broodmare? Come now, Shianidra, we treat our stock better than that. A war steed mates when she is ready and not before. Surely you don't reckon yourself as less than Hellsbane. Tarma's smile turned wicked. Or should I start catching handsome young men and parading them before you to tempt your appetite? Kathry laughed with mingled chagrin and relief, blushing hotly. Perhaps I ought to begin a collection, hmm? That's what we do for our war steeds, you know. Present them with a whole line of stallions until one catches their fancy. Shall I start a picket line for you? Or would you rather I acquired a house of pleasure and stocked the room so that you could try their paces at your leisure before choosing? Kathry rolled up into the covers to hide her blushes, still laughing. Tarma joined the laughter and limped back to her own bed, blowing out their candle and falling into the eiderdowns to find a dreamless and healing sleep. For there were going to be tomorrows. She was sure of that now and they'd better be in shape to be ready for them. This concludes The Oath Bound by Mercedes Lackey, narrated by Krista Lewis. Copyright 1988 by Mercedes R. Lackey. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Daw Books Incorporated and was produced in the year 2019 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.